All right. So I'm hoping my internet connection remains stable. Hello, everybody. So this is going to be my Carboniferous uh, critique, basically. Uh, we start off in the Carboniferous. Uh, according to science, it's based off the rock layers. So we start 359.2 to 299 million years ago. And this is basically falling on the heels of the Devonian and the Indevonian mass extinction. So what we see in the Carboniferous is a massive turnover from these earlier periods we found where placoderms and basically a large amount of trilobites and different types of ammonites were dominant in the seas. In the Carboniferous, you saw about 96% of all marine life die off. And after this point, you basically saw the emergence of uh, chondrichthians, sharks, and rays. You saw um, echinoderms and other types of cephalopod become more diverse. Uh, you still had the ammonites and trilobites survive, but otherwise you saw uh, sharks immediately kind of come to the fore. So what am I basically going to talk about today? As we, as we kind of get started, there's a lot of things and a lot of firsts that happen in the Carboniferous. Everybody kind of knows the Carboniferous from uh, the large amount of coal and hydrocarbon deposits that we see from this era. Um, you can basically thank the plants here. So we see club mosses become pretty dominant. So essentially, at this point in time, after we see most of the sea get absolutely wrecked by the Indivonian mass extinction again uh, event, basically what you're going to see in the exact aftermath of that is a large scale colonization and radiation of fauna and flora onto land. So keep in mind before this point, I'm gonna start with the plants because it's very easy for me to overlook the plants. I'm just gonna get them out of the way first thing. Before this time, you had very basic vascular plants and some species of fungus that appeared on land. So you had Cooksonia, a very basic vascular plant didn't even have true leaves it photosynthesized through its stem and then you had basically the emergence of most of what we would consider to be modern plants or at least the plants that you would see mostly dominant in the mesozoic and the rest of the permian era that is upcoming so one of the biggest ones to emerge are these club mosses and according to this site talking about plant evolution they claim that um, lepidodendron, um, due to its rapid growth, they produced a crop of stroboli and then died. Uh, I'm going to show you what these look like. And they, and they base that off of uh, pollen deposits that we can find in coal. One of the cool things about coal is that you can actually look at the coal itself. And the coal, it still basically preserves the shape of whatever it formed from in many cases. You can analyze the morphology of pollen grains. You can analyze the morphology of the actual wood remains. And this lepidodendron, they look mostly like this. So they're very different looking from what you probably imagine a tree looking like uh, by the mo most modern definition, but they seem to be very fast growing. As you can see here, they grow very quickly out of the ground. This is lepidodendron um, aculate, aculatium. I don't speak Latin. I'm okay with it. But as you can see here, they, they grow very quickly out of the ground and then they fall over and die. Now, a previous hypothesis, a perfect example of the uh, fallibility, I guess you could say, of speculation is the is the assumption that none of the organic matter broke down. But the reason you had coal deposits is because there were no bacteria or fungus that knew how to break down the lignin and the cellulose in these plants. What we know now is that if you look at peat bogs, if you look at dense rainforest, if you look at quick depositions of plants, if you look at this quick turnover, even if you have bacteria and fungus that can degrade these plants, if they're buried quick enough, if they're consumed in forest fires, like keep in mind, back at this time, a large amount of these plants, a large amount of phytoplankton, the earth being much hotter and humid than it is now, were very productive. So they produce a lot more oxygen, a lot more byproducts of their respiration. And as a result of this, we, you would see the CO2 levels throughout the period slowly decrease and the oxygen levels uh, rise in response to that.
And the effect that you get is a gradual cooling trend throughout the Carboniferous. So what we see here is over millions of years, you can see the actual CO2 content throughout the Carboniferous begin to sink. Because we begin our journey 359 million years ago, remember? And this only ends, let's see around the graph, about 299 million years ago. So we're getting about here. You know, you see that it peaks and then you see this precipitous drop off in atmospheric CO2 that doesn't even recover. Like it doesn't even begin to really pull out of itself until you see these punctuated mass extinctions. So you see from then onwards, we have almost a peak of CO2. Like we almost see like this massive peak in CO2 and then a slow decline throughout the Carboniferous. So the Carboniferous, when ammonites and all these shelled fossils, keep in mind, we can look back at history and reveal precedent. So with a lot of people today talking about like ocean acidification, coral bleaching, the, the destruction of, of animal shells, we need to remember that the life on Earth is very tenacious. Some of the largest shelled animals to ever exist, the ammonites, survived throughout this period when oceanic CO2 levels were four times what they are currently today. And the Earth had no ice. So the Earth was completely free of ice uh, until uh, maybe except for Gondwana. But the Earth was free of ice at the poles uh, at the beginning of the Carboniferous. And the conditions of this, if, if we look here, so let's see, according to uh, the UC Berkeley page, biologically, we see one of the greatest uh, evolutionary innovations, the carbon universe, the amniote egg. And we see tetrapods gain a huge amount of diversity. If you go to the Wikipedia, you know, everybody wants to talk about uh, kind of what happened with the insects. You can go over here and you can see these massive insects. You see uh, Meganeuropsis, you see the first development of flight in insects. So you, you have Meganeura, you have all these animals, but you also have the first dragonflies in general. You have, you have the first flying insects. You have most of the forms, like you see these giant scorpions, this Pullman Scorpius. You see how giant these, cre these creatures are, but this is also the beginning of the true terrestrial hexapods and the true diversification of arthropods into most niches on land. Uh, in the water, near water ecosystems, that's where you see the dominance of Timnus bondles and these relatively early uh, terrestrial animals that appear throughout the Carboniferous. And so it's like we see the uh, Petrolacosaurus, the earliest known. Keep in mind, earliest known. So when it was discovered by humans, but this doesn't tell us that this is the earliest uh, actual animal. This is just the earliest we found oldest known, earliest known, it's like, these are all interchangeable. And these creatures are all uh, relatively difficult to get a, get a handle on. They're so small, they live behind fragmentary remains. And they existed in ecosystems, like forest, these forest ecosystems within soils that are very acidic. But we still see a massive diversity in arthropods. Similarly, we see in the sea, all of these different sharks, all these different chondrichthians, all these different fish species take over from the previously dominant cephalopods of uh, of, the, of the Devonian as well as the placoderms. So those giant Dunkleosteus and those armored fish, they all died out. The, the effects that land had was uh, relatively minor compared to the absolute decimation the sea endured. In fact, according to almost every source, I mean, besides the great dying, this is probably the most devastating mass extinction that we see in the sea up until this point. So the final turnover in the oceans is insane, but it's really the diversification of these tetrapods that I want to talk about. Because remember back in the Devonian, I talked about what happened between 385 and 360 million years, where you go from fully aquatic lungfish, like you Stenopteron, and then you witness a full biological transformation, a full physiological transformation from simple swim bladders to fully functioning lungs. And in, and in animals, we see two types. So if you look back here, we have in our, in our Wikipedia page, this is the only thing I'm going to take from Wikipedia, but it's like, you can see this, we have the first diapsid and synapsid. So what is thought to be the, the ancestor or a stem relative close ancestor of the first 
animals that led to the mammals and therapsids and all that. And then those that led to diapsids, so the pedosaurs and archosaurs. So what you think of like lizards and, and turtles and crocodiles and dinosaurs. And we see that these, we find the seropsids, which are almost the same. It, the diapsids, just that's a skull trait of having two holes in the skull, synapsid one. And they draw all kinds of things from there. But you also have pederpes. Like, it, it sounds kind of ridiculous, but if you actually look at the size of this hulking creature, this creature is considered to be like an in-between, like a transitional fossil between the reptiles and the amphibians based off of wishful thinking mostly. But what we see here is that even though the tetrapods have become this diverse, we see almost every single major insect clade emerge in the Carboniferous. This is a time of unparalleled transformation for the arthropods. They they will encompass most niches on land. It, it'll be the first and only time they're really ever the dominant megafauna or mesofauna on uh, on the surface of the earth. And scientists explain that this is due to their breathing methods. So we see at least one form, the, the blind lung emerged during this time. Whether or not there was uh, unidirectional breathing like we see in uh, many of the archosaurs has yet to be determined. Maybe that trait developed later on, but at least we know that the blind lung emerged. You have these alveoli that are filled with blood vessels and air moves in due to negative pressure, like pressure differentials into these alveoli. There is then an exchange of CO2 and oxygen with the red blood cells. And then the process continues as a person breathes and their heart beats. There's a circulation of blood, a circulation of air and gas exchange that allows for CO2, which is toxic, to leave our system and oxygen to enter in. Keep in mind, this is essentially uh, fundamentally different from what we see in lungfish and what we saw in Eustenopteron 385 million years ago. By 359 million years ago, we... Okay, so keep in mind, this is now 20 million years after the fact, okay? So, but this is 20 million years after the emergence of what creatures that we know were able to breathe in this fashion. So the primitive lungs are like those of amphibians, they say, for the lungfish. But, and they think that the lungs may have derived from a swim bladder. But these lungs are very basic. What we see in lungfish, the transition from a completely uh, aquatic animal to one that is mostly terrestrial. So a fish swims upwards of positions such that the tip of the snout barely touches the water's surface. The mouth is then open wide and the fish sucks air from just above the water. So what we see in animals is a few we have a few innovations that have to take place. In order for an animal to colonize land, uh, there's a lot that has to go on. We talk about, so we go back to these creatures, like what's the, what's the true difference between, like, let's see, let, let's what's the key difference between, let's say, let me see, I don't know if I have exactly. So this is this is good. So we have these images here. We, we have what looks like this ecosystem. So how do we get, from this creature here, how, how do we get from just a basic bare bones lungfish, something like this, to, to an animal that can move about on land? We see how choked and how diverse and how sprawling this ecosystem is. And what we see similarly is that animals didn't just develop lungs. They didn't just develop the ability to walk on land. They, had, they, had, they underwent a radical physiological transformation to colonize land in the amount of time it took for basically bison and cattle to diverge. They had a radical transformation of their bone structure, radical transformation of their all of their limb bones, their pelvic as well as uh, as well as shoulder girdles, uh, clavicles, the extension and mobility of the neck was increased. The tongue developed in order to help it swallow on dry land. Uh, and even the skin, we don't think about the skin of amphibians actually having adaptations for land, but now the amphibians, especially in modern amphibians, are able to absorb water through the skin to help um, to help them absorb oxygen, uh, where the lungs wouldn't help them stay underwater longer. And this is part of the adaptations amphibians go through. There's this assumption that amphibians are like almost fish, but the amphibian uh, the amphibian genome in modern amphibians especially, is much larger oftentimes 
than the mammalian genome. So we see a huge amount of diversity in modern amphibians, but these early amphibians, uh, many of them aren't related to later amnio egg laying reptiles and stuff, but apparently about one or two times, or maybe just one time, they don't know, one of these amphibians not only laid the first amniotic egg and it developed scales, but they also began to further specialize their, uh, their digestive system, their respiratory system, their cardiovascular system, their, uh, their skeletal system, their muscular system, all of that to optimize themselves to land. You, you see here, you're going in what? There's a total of like 50 million years in the Carboniferous, okay? And so by the late Carboniferous, after like 30 million years, you're getting, you're going from amphibians to creatures like this in 30 million years. So about half the time, if you stretch back the clock, 30 million years, you're going from an amphibian to that. You stretch back another, just, just another uh, 20 million years, 350. So it's at 360. So just 30 million years plus what, 45. So in 45 million years, that's 10 million years shorter than the amount of time it took to go from Eohippus, the dawn horse, the smallest horse, to modern Equus. You're going from fully aquatic lungfish to reptiles in that, in that same time period. And this is all pieced together beautifully and perfectly uh, and totally no ghost lineages, to totally like complete fossil record here. Uh, comparative anatomists have cracked the puzzle. In 45 million years, you can go from a fully aquatic lungfish to a fully functioning amniote egg laying reptile. No other amphibian has done this since. And we think that it either happened just once or twice in tetrapods. Uh, and here we go. So the Carboniferous rainforest collapse. I am going to come back to this later. But we can observe that these creatures eventually... Uh, became dominant in the ecosystem because before that obviously the amphibians were doing their thing and dominating most of the niches that these poor little amniotes would have occupied in but they say it's they they survive better in cooler drier conditions they prosper due to key adaptations including the egg and having keratinized scales and claws the thing about this is is that a lot of what evolutionists claim is based off of this evolutionary pressure, this selective pressure that works in conjunction with the base mutation rate to provide a myriad of polymorphisms that are then selected for over time in a general direction that best aids survival. I have a hard time seeing then that when the amniotic egg, so let's, let's see. So they don't have to return the water to lay their eggs. So they think because they didn't have to return to the water, because they didn't think that they had to deal with that many temperature extremes, even at this time, as the as the plant was generally cooling, you wouldn't you would get like fluctuations. But it wasn't until later that you saw the formation of Pangaea, as all the continents like Gondwana and all these early land masses fused to get Pangaea. Before that time, everything was hot, humid, and mostly just tropical all throughout the planet. Very productive ecosystems. What impetus then is there to develop? an amniote egg? What impetus is there to develop scales? Why did these emerge? What pressure did they have to, for it to emerge? Because they only say this conferred an advantage when things started to get bad. So what was the evolutionary impetus? What was the selective pressure in this ecosystem to develop amniote eggs and scales when good old-fashioned amphibian lifestyles were perfectly fine? And the reason I bring this up is because the radical transformation that scientists claim occurred with tetrapods in just 45 million years was not mimicked in the most diverse and the most prolific clade of animals that the Earth has ever seen. In tetrapods, you see a different breathing system. So let's just go here. We have the book lungs of the arachnids, but most arthropods have trachea. So it's not like the trachea in your throat. These are air sacs that are expanded and contracted due to muscular movement, peristaltic 
motion of the muscles. So if you see here, grasshoppers have no lungs and they do not use the circular system to move oxygen. They transport air directly to tissues, uh, to tissue cells using tracheal tubes. So these epithelial cells are where the gas exchange occurs uh, within the trachea. So grasshoppers use different uh, breathing methods when they are resting, alert, hopping, or flying. The alert grasshopper is shown here is pumping its abdomen to change the volume of its air sacs. This helps air through the trachea. So notice also that in modern, and so in these amphibians, you go back 359 million years ago, right at the end of the Carboniferous, we see the first fully, we see the first terrestrial amphibians. We go from Eusthenopteron 385 million years ago. By the start of the Carboniferous, we have animals like um, Tolferdon that are terrestrial amphibians, full radical transformation of the skeletal system, the muscular system, the digestive system, neurological systems, endocrine systems, reproductive systems, everything. These creatures went from lungfish to reptiles in 45 million years. Every single system in their body has now been transformed. In insects, we see such radical polymorphism. We see them adopt almost every single form, every katydid and cicada, every cockroach and arach every cockroach and mite and scorpion. It's it's like most modern animal forms, even if they're very basal and not differentiated quite as yet, like the Hymenoptera, you still see a huge diversity of these insects' life. And, and we see the first flying insects. We see that these insects radically change what they say are gill structures on their backs in order to be used specifically for flight. So we see the first animals develop flight, not only develop flight, but specialize into modern forms like we see in the Meganeura. So it's not that insects were in any way, shape, or form conservative. There is, there is very little conservatism actually with insects. Ah, uh, yeah. Science call. So you're, you're actually just in time, Emmanuel. But so we see that at this period of time, insects don't display the character conservatism that we assume insects have because of having tens, if not hundreds of million years of experience with them. By the beginning of the Carboniferous, we already see animals on land. That's beautiful 15 million year window that goes from lungfish that are literally just fish with modified swim bladders to fully terrestrial amphibians that are capable of supporting their own weight with their limbs. So every single major muscle group and bone in their body, their entire cardiovascular system, their heart, their tongues, the palates of their mouths, their eyes, their noses, everything, every mucous membrane, every square inch of their skin, everything changes. And then especially once you get to the late Carboniferous, keep in mind, just another 30 million years, uh, you're going, you're going now, you're assuming that, okay, going from 359 to 299 million years ago, in about 45 million years, because we go back and we look at, we look at these early fossils, and we see by the time you get to these early diapsids, there is no radical change of the respiratory system in insects. Not only that, but we've never seen radical cardiovascular change in insects. So the amniote egg, the scales, this hyper-specialization to live on land at a time where other animals like the tenospondyls were dominant, these reptiles appear from, from amphibians just once or maybe just twice, whether they're an, a, a synapsid or, or diapsid or seropsid, but we see this emerge about one or two times, maybe, and no actual evolutionary reason is given for this. They say, oh, it's because, and let's look directly at the UC Berkeley source. This is because, what, quote? So they think this happened specifically because, where was it? Yeah. Trend towards aridity and an increase in terrestrial habitat led to the increasing importance of the amniotic egg for reproduction. So this is where it all breaks down because the trend of aridity and increase in terrestrial habitat was a result of tectonic plate movement, a result of Pangaea forming from Gondwana and other supercontinents. This took tens of millions of years, and we already know that the actual effects of rainforest collapse ha were, were not underway until at least a few 10 million, until the very end of the Carboniferous. 
So it's only in the last few million years of the Carboniferous that you see this rainforest collapse phenomenon. You don't see it in the middle of the Carboniferous when we're supposed to believe that all of these amniotes started to develop. So we see an explosion, for example, in plant diversity. If we go back to plants, this is, everything's changing. So you see the, the flora and fauna of the Carboniferous. We see all of these, all these scientists dating these 310 million years ago. And we see lycopsids, the club mosses, these giant trees, these lepidodendrons that are said to be the source of all of this hydrocarbon that we can pull out of the ground today. We, before this time, just had cooksonia and bryophytes, literally moss and plants that photosynthesize through their stems. Every single clade of animals on land diversified. Now you saw ferns, you saw cycads, you saw horsetails, equisetium, conifers, and these club mosses appear from literal thin air from nowhere. And even though that's a conundrum, we can at least say these are vascular plants. It's a continuation of things that came before. But what do you say about amniotes? Like, where's the explanation for where the amniote egg actually come from? It's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? One of the biggest mysteries is amniotes were not dominant. If this was truly, if UC Berkeley was right in this assessment, and this was something that emerged, what? purely as a result of like here, all the CO2 and like the temperature of the planet Earth, we can see that during the Carboniferous, it was hot and then it cooled down drastically before heat for, for slowly heating back up. And we see in CO2 levels slowly precipitously decreasing throughout the period. This is a period, if you can see, of almost 120 million years. That is not a sudden climactic shift. This is, this is climate change that took almost twice as long as the, as the dinosaurs have been extinct to occur. So this is not some sudden event. The, the amniotes appeared tens of million years before this supposed aridification and cooling of, of the land due, due to this com combination of the continents. So we see these massive coal beds. We see the uh, emergence of the amniotic egg. But let's see. Predators with long snouts, sprawling limbs, and flattened heads, such as the Timnus fondles, like Amphibiamus, like this creature right here, uh, appeared. Athracosaurs, basal tetrapods, amniotes with deep skulls, and less sprawling bowder that afforded greater agility. Appeared to the Carboniferous, fall, quickly followed by the diapsids, which refers to two groups, the marine reptiles, lizards and snakes, and the archosaurs and crocodiles. So the diapsid, what is a diapsid? So a diapsid has two holes in the skull. And they believe that all of these, and all the seropsians, so the diapsids are all reptiles except turtles. Turtles are still grouped as lepidosaurs. They are still seen as seropterygians. But the assumption of number of holes in the skull being your descent is exactly why they will also sit here and say, oh, um, Arecothyrus, that's the first, you know, that's the ancestor of all synapsids. It has the one hole in its skull. It has heterodonty. It has this little canine here. And because of its heterodonty, because of that extra hole in the skull, we can confidently say that uh, that it, it's definitely a stem mammal, even though we know from turtles that this probably wasn't the case. What are you saying, man? Oh, yeah. And Happy New Year's. It's great. Ah, oh, yeah, man. The eating habits. I'm, I've fallen off the eating habits for sure. I've been, I've been eating terribly recently. I'm kind of getting better. I'm not eating as much sugar, but it's bad. Um, yeah, so the oxygen and nitrogen levels were... So the oxygen levels were especially high during this time. And we know that they started basically pretty high. Like as all this plant activity, as this worldwide forest was churning out all of this uh, water vapor and all of this, uh, all of this oxygen that it kept the planet hot. Remember, water vapor is actually one of the most efficient greenhouse gases. People don't look at water vapor as a greenhouse gas, but it is. And this large amount of water vapor kept the planet hot and humid. But as we can see, over the course of time, the temperature, the temperature and the CO2 levels dropped. But this correlating factor is a result of what they say is the slow aridification. The issue with this idea, though, is that this aridification, because of tectonic activity, didn't, didn't really affect forests that were on the coast, only until that actually fused, only until the actual sea in the middle dried up between Gondwan and the other supercontinents, do, do we actually see this transformation? We could see like supercontinent 
Pangea over time. And if we go there, I guess this is Wikipedia, but you, you can see here, this is Pangea. So this is Pangea. We saw Gondwana move north and fuse with basically what is going to become, and this is actually a really good picture, fuse with what was going to become North America and most of Euro or, uh, Europe and Asia. So Eurasia, North America, Africa, India, the Middle East, Australia, and South America all fused. Before this time, this landmass Gondwana was further south and concentrated at the pole. And that may have been the only place where you didn't see forest and maybe just had like bare ground or something. But there was no ice age. At the end of the Carboniferous and at the start of the Permian, there was ice at the poles. But the thing is about this time period is that tectonic shift is very slow. We don't know the actual true impetus or cause of the amniote egg developing. There's never get, there is never actually an explanation for it. They just say it emerged. It miraculously appeared. Like all this selective pressure and you just miraculously can create a calcified egg. All the machinery, all the complete restructuring of the reproductive tract necessary to do that. And that makes total sense. What to them sounds like complete and utter ridiculousness is the idea that, well, why couldn't insects? Because this is the big question. If this just makes sense, if it's like, oh, well, it, it, it gave them these benefits. And so they started to develop it. And it was just a random chance. Why then didn't insects, as polymorphic as they are with the short generation times that they have, they have one of the quickest mutation rates and speciation rates of any animal in nature. You know, even if you're not an evolutionist, you can point out and see like, wow, insects are really diverse. They seem to become very diverse quickly. And that's because the amount of genetic flexibility within insects, their tolerance towards inbreeding, their ability to maintain multiple polymorphisms in the population and remain healthy. It's like you can start an entire population from just two insects. Uh, yeah. And this is how it is. It's basically, trust me, bro. But it's also these tetrapods breed slower. They have fewer offspring. And they are obviously, from what we see in the fossil record, and in, even in the modern day, not as diverse, nor as concentrated and ubiquitous as insects are. And yet, they were still able to undergo a radical physiological transformation in 45 million years based solely on natural selection and environmental impetus combined with their base mutation rate. Because remember, this is how all evolution supposedly happens. A creature's base mutation rate uh, creates new alleles or variations of existing alleles, duplications, deletions, etc. Those then in the next generation, if it happens in their germline, is expressed in their offspring. And if those offspring have a survival benefit, they will have more offspring be more fit and or just be more likely to survive and pass on their genes to the next generation. This is a cumulative effect. It's like just because you're born a gigachad doesn't mean a rock won't fall on you or you won't get snatched by a predator. It just means the likelihood of that happening is lower. That process that is described as evolution, this, this natural selection that's occurring, it doesn't make sense when you apply it to different things. For tetrapods, it makes total sense. Wow, you know, the it seems to be cool, getting cooler and more arid. And what do you know? They develop scales and claws and the amniote egg. It's, it's a miracle. You know, these are all, it makes sense because there is this strong natural selection pressure to do this. But what about the insects? This tracheal system, I could see it becoming more advanced, can't you? You can see these air sacs expanding, probably becoming more specialized. Uh, there's obvious ways that an animal could make its book lungs, for example. Like we see in, in modern isopods, especially land during ro roly polies, very inefficient. You have to keep them constantly moist. There's, of course, got to be a way to internalize it. You could undergo a ton of, of physiological transformations. If, if insects could even undergo a fraction of the physiological changes that lungfish could go through to start to start breathing air, let alone the amount of transformations that amphibians had to go through to become what we see as the sauropsids and synapsids, not just one lineage, but potentially two different lineages, the sauropsids and the synapsids. Are we then supposed to assume that insects couldn't go through the same thing when we know that they have the fastest mutation rate and the fastest rate of diversification of any animals in nature. And yet they still, even to this very day, preserve an extremely inefficient and extremely hindering air system. Natural selection on these giant animals would have had them physiologically adapt. It, it took tens of million years. 
wouldn't they be able to respond like, oh, oxygen's getting less efficient. We're going to select for the ones that can maintain these large sizes, that may select for the ones that can remain competitive as mesofauna. Like, oh, I can stay big because I have a more efficient trachea and that selection positive feedback loop will eventually make the respiratory system of insects more efficient. Isn't that how it works in animals? That's, that's the explanation given for tetrapods. Oh, that these small little changes, they just snowballed out of control. It's just microevolution plus millions of generations and you'll get change. Except when you don't. Except when it's radical physiological transformation for me, but not for thee. Insects, even highly derived insects, look at these things. Every single one of them, insects could modify gill parts. They say, oh, well, it's not possible. How, how so? All of all the flying insects, they modified gill parts on their backs. We don't even really understand what structures wings emerged from. And yet they were able to develop wings. And not only develop wings, but develop flight. Not only develop flight, but become the most dominant aerial hunters that we'll probably ever see until the emergence of the pterosaurs. They dominated the skies until the Triassic. For, for you know, hundreds of millions, um, we're talking hundreds of millions of years of complete insect dominance of the skies. Wouldn't these mega neurons, wouldn't there be strong overriding selection pressure to maintain their sizes, to keep them in this dominant size? Wouldn't there be strong selective pressure to keep the, the pulmono scorpius big and competitive against amphibians? Why would they, if they had tens of millions of years to adapt and could assume all of these different forms, radically alter almost every other part of their physiology that they weren't able to radically alter their re respiratory system like the tetrapods did. How were the tetrapods able to magically metamorph the, every single major system in their body, but insects couldn't magically metamorph their res respiratory system have a massive advantage or at least a competitive edge against the tetrapods? So what's said to be just common sense natural selection in tetrapods is lambasted as you know, oh, that's, well, evolution isn't always efficient. It just does what works. But is that considered working? Is, is losing your place as, as mesofauna considered working? I mean, insects have developed all of these different strategies, all these different polymorphism, beetles and, and katydids and praying mantises and the ancestors of basically every single insect, insect lineage we know of emerges in the Carboniferous, yet for some reason, from the myriapods to the hexapods, not a one of them produces or develops a, a more efficient respiratory tract to compete against the unidirectional and blind breathing methods, both of which highly specialized, that appeared in the tetrapods during this time period. The, 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 radical, the radical change of the body plan from, from this, from, from lungfish, so let's like look look what they did. The dipnoid from the early Devonian possessed skull and dental features that were characteristically dipnoid, but also had features in common with other Sarcopterygian groups. So they were bent until the Triassic until their numbers decreased. So they point at these old lungfish. They were like, oh, they look just like lungfish. That's 323 to 251 million years ago. So think about that. 323 million years ago, the Carboniferous started 359 million years ago. If you go to 251, that overlaps. It says Pennsylvania to Permian times. So it's not like you didn't also have, still have lungfish, that you didn't still have all these forms. These, these creatures underwent radical transformation and their ancestors or their cousins remained in the environments they were originally in. Yeah. So that's, that's true. But what we see in the reduction of insects, it's not due to a mass extinction. What's very clear in the Carboniferous record, actually, is not that insects like died out and just the small insects survived. We see that the slow general lack of oxygen constricted their size. It's like it's not that Meganeuropsis necessarily even died out. According to most scientists, they did. But it's mostly that you would see animals that look just like Meganeuropsis, just smaller and smaller and smaller over time. Same thing with Pomo scorpius. Like if you actually look at these creatures, they look dead on like modern relatives, but just smaller. Like it looks just like a cockroach. Amphithor blatina, that's blatoidea. It's literally a giant cockroach. Pomo scorpius, literally just a giant scorpion. Arthropleura, literally a giant centipede. 
Mega Neuropsis or Mega Neuro, they're just dry dragonflies. They're, they're, they've been enabled because their respiratory system is so inefficient. They have to, they have to basically do this to survive on land. But we, we see in tetrapods, creatures that don't have as fast a mutation rate, don't have as many children per generation, don't have the same amount of flexibility in terms of polymorphism that we see from insects. The insects radiated much quicker and much more decisively than the tetrapods, but we don't see them change their physiology to be more efficient at breathing on land. And yet we believe the same exact process was possible for tetrapods. So when we go on from there and, and reach our, our natural sort of build up to this, uh, we see all these plants. We see the Timnus the Timnus bundles, uh, Colorado pond, the the oh Colorado derpidon. It's like ugh, Arthur and um, Anthracosaurus, all these reptile-like amphibians that are transitional. What we actually see is the sudden and radical appearance of reptiles. So re it's not even that reptiles just appeared; it's that they just it's just that one moment they're gone in the fossil record, and we just miraculously dug them up so 306 million years ago 306 million years ago if you if you if you noticed the carboniferous ended 299 million years ago so this is set, considered seven million years before the end of the carboniferous still before the mass extinction the, ma the massive rainforest collapse so seven million years before this isn't even the ar oldest archaeothyrus but we still see it seven million years before this massive this massive you know rainforest collapse event occur but until that rainforest collapse we didn't see uh these creatures dominant whatsoever we still saw the large amphibians be dominant so yeah so they had no reason to change if we uh, if we take that so remember what evolutionists say uh, that's a perfect uh, the evolutionary equilibrium copium that is very frequently used that's apparently if you look at the actual dogma right now according to the scientific method that's not how this is supposed to work what's supposed to happen is that your own base mutation rate plus time will cause changes to your base genome and cause a change typically either because of sexual or natural selection in one direction or another the idea of a static species the idea of a uh, conservative species, the idea of a quote, living fossil. It's like living fossil literally triggers these people because their entire ideology is built upon the idea that animals do what the tetrapods do, that they'll, if you just give them enough time, they'll undergo these radical and miraculous transformations in no time flat, less than 50 million years. You're going from lungfish to, to, you know, the earliest mammal relatives, but they don't want to admit and look at crocodiles and be like, well, we found a crocodile that looks like a crocodile from the from the mid Jurassic. And we found a bird that looks like a bird from the late Jurassic. And we found a horseshoe crab that looks like a horseshoe crab from like the Carbonifera. It's like you can go on and on and on with like frilled sharks and coelacanths and tur sea turtles and point to all these different animals that are clearly either analogs or modern and they're like oh well they're not related to it it's a completely different lineage just these aren't even real real turtles or these are you know, it's just the amount of cope is insane because people are comparative anatomists after all you know, their entire shtick is taking like ankle morphology of of dorodon and saying that whales come come from hoofed animals like pachycetus because of ankle morphology and some dubious 77 percent confidence interval bootstrap studies about whale and hippo dna it's just ridiculous but we'll look at a fully intact. And I'll sh I'll show this one when I get to the Jurassic episode because that that gets pretty interesting too. When you actually look at these animals and be like, yeah, try to find the difference between these two animals, and it's like a crocodile from 150 million years ago and a modern crocodile, and it's just it's Cope City because you look at it, it's like try to tell the difference. If I if I hand you these two different casts, will you be able to tell the difference between a Nile crocodile and this like? ancient crocodile relative it's hilarious to watch but one thing you do see though you see this radical transformation you see not only the scales and the claws and the amniote egg you also see that with no explanation besides oh it just it, it helped them later on so they became more dominant but no explanation of what impetus or pressure caused it so that's miraculous insects on the other hand which would have inferred a huge benefit had they even remotely got 
It's like no lungs, no, no circulatory system to move oxygen. It's like insects could have developed a better heart. It's like something as easy as just expanding the size of their heart, uh, obtaining a, a closed circulatory system, uh, just expanding certain aspects of the trachea and reducing others to maximize efficiency. Very minor changes to the respiratory system of an insect would give it an advantage that would allow it to stay at, at a decent size. But, you know, insects can develop wings out of their backs from virtually nothing from the most insignificant structures and develop not only flight, but the ability to fly faster than almost any animal in, in the animal kingdom until you got to like hummingbirds and stuff just has it on lock, but can't develop like, you know, these dragonflies that are super efficient. They just, you know, can't be bothered to develop a more efficient heart or a closed circulatory system or more efficient trachea whatsoever. Like, you know, it's, that's the issue with evolution is that there's this idea that there's always this trend towards efficiency and they act like, oh, well, it's just what works. It's just what works. But obviously this didn't work because insects had lost their place as mesofauna and megafauna and would never gain it back. Like you had pretty big insects throughout history, but you would never see arthropods get to this place again. All because even after all this time, their, their ability to breathe hasn't changed since the early Carboniferous. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, we could, it, this could have been men in black. You know, you could have had giant sentient cockroach people. Maybe it's a good thing that they never developed this, but there's no evolutionary reason why they shouldn't. There's no evolutionary reason why natural selection shouldn't have made their respiratory systems more efficient like it did with lungfish. Why, why is it that lungfish could undergo these radical changes? And it's super like obvious and explained away, but we still see this high amount of physiological conservatism in insects. Is it maybe that this is perhaps overblown? Or am I just snorting crack and it just makes, I'm, I'm just, oh, you're just, you're missing it, bro. You're, you're missing it. It, it. it can't happen for insects. Because it's just, it just works for insects. Don't you know? It's like, a, you know, if it don't, it's not broke, don't fix it. You, you know, it, all, my oxygen levels. So they can't explain away why insects, the most dynamic and diverse of all animals on earth, couldn't develop more efficient respiratory systems. But of course, your your quintessential lungfish can become a, a actual, a, a, bearded lizard in in just a few you know in less time it took eohippus to become modern horses so that's that's basically kind of where the carboniferous leaves us as we transition into the permian but i want to talk about some other species too at this time you still had trilobites at this time you still had at least one species of eurypterid on land the placoderms were gone but you still had like echinoderms you still had your crinoids you still had all of these animals that we also see today but also in the same exact forms. So it's like, we see a mass amount of diversity, but you're starting to see like sea urchins and anemones and, and starfish. These creatures, these, these fauna take up like modern forms that we can actually notice. And uh, again, sharks. Sharks are one of the big ones. Like you talked about chondrichthians, but if we actually look at the chondrichthians themselves, the actual sharks, like, yeah, they're pretty diverse. I don't think they, they showed here. I'm going to have to go back to Wikipedia like I hate to do. But if you actually look at the sharks, one of the good things that Wikipedia has is the ability to kind of, oh, I don't even think they have the sharks. Did I miss it? Oh, here. Of course. Look at this. Ornithoprion. Look, look at the radical change in the physiology of that shark. All these spiral face sharks, all of these different types, all these, like, chimeras these spiny backed sharks like you see all this diversity look look at this guy look at this guy little animal sharks all these spikes all these different protrusions that we see deposit in the fossil record and this happened quick in just a few 10 million years uh tens of millions of years we saw this in sharks so it's not even confined to animals on land we see massive radiations at sea too but also interestingly especially with the invertebrates a large amount of conservatism, animals that we can clearly, clearly see and define as, as modern forms. So we see, we see these guys, they emerge, when did they say? Early Carboniferous. So these creatures emerged very quickly in just a few, in just like 10 million years, you got sharks like this. After 96% of all the oceans were cleared of life, 96% of species died in the ocean, only 4% survived. And yet, Right after this, and we see this time and time again, cycles of creation, radical, disastrous, apocalyptic destruction, followed by mass radiation events. Nothing new. 
but none of it is ever explained. None of it is ever given a solid reason. What is causing this radiation? They say, oh, all of these niches open up. But niches don't explain radical physiological transformation. Like I mentioned before, and it's almost like beating a dead horse, you only get evolution when you have natural selection happening on novel alleles that emerge because of mutation. If you don't have the mutation, if you don't have the alleles, there's nothing to select for, period. And so people point that out as an argument against the whole thing I'm seeing about insects. Like, oh, well, they just didn't develop the alleles. There was all this time and there was no mutations that would have allowed for a more efficient respiratory system as opposed to animals. The same mutations could allow them to get wings, but they just never, it was just after millions of years, they, they were never lucky enough to get that. So what was holding insects back then? You can't tell me that there was no insect that had a more efficient respiratory system at any point in time. And maybe we got here because this is a more derived system, but it doesn't make sense. If, the, if this evolutionist model is to be believed, then these, this trachea system should have been much more specialized. This should have specialized over time. These structures should become more efficient, but they never did. And we see this time and time again with multiple different clades. You see uh, all these innovations in, in certain animals and what, some parts in the, and not in others. But for terrestrial animals, we're, get, we're given this measure of, oh, you know, these animals, they have, they have these basal traits that they just can't get rid of. It's this evolutionary baggage. But that doesn't apply to lungfish. And that doesn't apply to amphibians. And it doesn't apply to lizards. You, you can have fish become amphibians. You can have amphibians become lizards. You can have lizards become mammals and dinosaurs. But you can't have grasshoppers become big grasshoppers. That's too much of a stretch. Oh, the, 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 the effect on its rest. So it is. So you you're going to sit here and say like, oh well, this is just unimaginable changes to to something fundamental and basal to the insect. Talked about the same thing about dentition. Say like, oh well, synapsids. It's like, oh, I know that turtles are anapsid, but we're still going to place them with the diapsids because we think it's a derived trait. We we base all of our taxonomy and systematics off of holes in the skull, except with except with turtles. They could be the exception to the rule. But trust me, bro, it's all it's all still legit. But this is the big issue. And even then, if you look up here, we go from the blind lung, and we know even in the Permian, these physiological changes didn't stop. In the Sauropterygians, and especially in the archosaurs, we see unidirectional breathing develop. We see air sacs develop. We see further innovations in the archosaurs, the, Saur the Sauropterygians, if we look back to these guys. Scroll down and we go to the Sauropsids. Eventually, if you go through and you go to the archosaurs, you will see that the archosaurs, so the crocodiles, the birds, uh, the pterosaurs, all develop unidirectional breathing. So their innovations don't stop in the Carboniferous. It's not like a one-off thing. Their innovations to the respiratory system continued in the Permian as well. So that's one of the major conundrums that, honestly, people need to look at when talking about the likelihood of radical transformative biological change. Because if you can sit here and say, oh, well, insects can't change their trachea and change their breathing system, make that more efficient, that more hyper-specialized because of all these basal traits, reasons, genetics, whatever, then how does that suddenly work for lungfish? How does that suddenly work for Eusthenopteron? How does that work for Teleperdon? How does that work for all these early Sauropterygians? How, do, how are you then getting the amniote egg with no explanation out of thin air, with no genuine actual explanation for how the amniote egg really came about. If I go back to UC Berkeley's document, if, I, if I'm if i talking to UC Berkeley, they, all they say, a trend towards aridity and an increased terrestrial habitat led to the increasing importance of the amniote egg. So increasing importance. They don't actually tell you, oh, they'll talk about, oh, those seedless plants, da, 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 da. But they don't tell you where this amniote egg comes from. If you read these articles, this is published by UC Berkeley. They give you no explanation from the amniote egg. The amniote egg is like this magical pixie dust thing. It's just like live birth in mammals. They say, oh, it came from a virus. And let me see here. It's, yeah, it's the need to be right. That's what it mainly is. It's the need to be right about everything. You don't want to mention the living fossils. You don't want to mention ghost lineages. You don't want to mention biological conservatism when it sticks in the craw of your theories like this. They can't explain the origin of the amniote egg. They can't explain why the 
anapsitrate being derivative for turtles doesn't mess up all the attempts to say, oh, we found a, we found a diapsid, therefore we found the earliest relative of all diapsids. Oh, we found a synapsid, we, we must have found the earliest relative of all synapsids. But you're going to sit here and have turtles, which are anapsid, be placed in the lepidosaurs alongside snakes and stuff, and they're anapsid. So this is a trait that they've used to predicate entire clades, like entire clades are stuck on this, based solely on the number of holes in the skull. And they'll sit here with confidence and be like, oh, well, this is the oldest synapsid, the oldest synapsid of all synapsids. But unfortunately, when you actually have, it's like, okay, they're, they're heterodont in some respect, and they're synapsid, therefore they derive from all, like all synapsids come from this, or it's a relative of all synapsids. We have to point to the fact that if turtles and other animals in the fossil record can secondarily derive these traits, or if we, if we look at other fossils and maybe the heterodonty isn't ex as extreme or it's much more ambiguous, it's like, where do you draw these lines? When you're using solely comparative anatomy to make grandiose claims about the origins of life on Earth, you're not getting a whole and complete picture. You're, you're trying to piece together a narrative based on your own bias. And so we go back and we see the Argosus crocodiles, all these guys. So... Synapsis made the first appearance, presumably anapsids did as well, although the oldest fossil for that group are from the lower Permian. So think about that. We go at the beginning of the Permian, we see the first terrestrial animals, 300, uh, 365 uh, to 380 million years. And then shortly after that point in time, you see the emergence of, look, 355, 299, 45 million years is the timeline from lungfish to reptile. Not only reptile, but all the lineages of all modern megafauna and mesofauna that we see today. The Sauropterygians, which are the ancestors of the birds, ancestors of the turtles, ancestors of the crocodiles, ancestors of the snakes, ancestors of the lizards and the sphenodonts, so the tuatara, the pterosaurs, everything from, from Brachiosaurus to the Agama lizard. Then the synapsids, you say, oh, well, that, and, you know, the emergence of the first relatives of, of what eventually became like the cynodonts and mammals, but also the dinocephalians and therocephalians and gorgonopsids and everything. It's like every single animal you can think of apparently got its beginning in the Carboniferous and the same applies to insects too. So this is like the bedrock. This is like where it all really begins for these, for these creatures on land. And even though we could talk a lot about what happened at sea, it's really this that sets the stage for everything. Because these insects, insect forms were actually very useful and efficient. Despite not being able to maintain their, their size, they just got smaller and these same forms were highly dominant. What they really just needed was one change to one major system of their body and they could have become more efficient. But we, see, we still see, even though this massive amount of change with insects, the insects just became bigger, smaller, more stretched versions of previous forms and those previous forms appeared out of nowhere at the beginning of the Carboniferous in a massive radiation event. With these animals, we see an, an early stage where holes in the skull differ, are, are basically where you place these animals, but they emerge with almost no explanation given. They emerge, they have their amniote egg and their claws and their scales and all this keratinization, but no actual explanation no reasons given, no, I mean, there hardly is even speculation, not even a best guess given for the origin of all of these animals and their traits. So when you're an evolutionist and you're, and you're trying to piece together, okay, what exactly happened here? What's the mystery of the amniotic egg? Where did we first find the amniotic egg? Uh, how do we know it exists? And it's because you can find fragmentary shell remains of calcified eggs or you just find egg beds, you find complicated behavior. But that also brings you to another thing. It's like amphibians lay their eggs in water, they hatch into tadpoles, they go through this holometabolic metamorphosis, and they go from tadpole to... It's like you don't see that with lizards. You know, lizards hatch, and they are they, they don't have that. They, they are straight up smaller individual forms, miniature forms of later lizards. The difference between a lizard and an amphibian is not just scales. It's not just... Uh, claws or the ability to lay an egg, it's multiple, multiple genetic, physiological, and life history changes that occur that distances it from water one, but also has it accumulate a large number of traits 
almost all at the same time that allow it to survive better on land. So it's like you just you didn't get everything staggered into it, was, it wasn't like 10 or 20 million years later that you got scales after the amniote egg. It's like you got you basically just got lizards. They they just emerged and be, partially because of the fragmentary fossil remains that we have, just the nature of the fossil record, but also just the straight up miraculous nature of how of how the natural world works being explained away by, oh, well, it, it would have helped them with drier. It, it helped them with the drier conditions. Again, drier conditions that took, according to this graph, according to all the data we have on this, tens of millions of years to occur. A cooling trend, a decrease in oxygen, uh, or and a, de uh, a decrease in global CO2 levels, all precipitated over the course of the entire Carboniferous as Gondwana fused to make Pangaea with all the other supercontinents. So, as as I go on, they're saying it's an edge. Okay. So, eggs and skillet skin appearing out of thin air and never appearing again in any other amphibian clade. Okay. Uh, the holes in the skull being definitive evidence that you belong to certain clade unless you're turtles, in which case, you know, you're the exception to the rule. But we go and have Pangaea, we have the decimation of all of these forests, we have the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse. So, we, Well, let's see what UC Berkeley says on the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse. I think, I don't know if it's highlighted here, but, okay. The appearance and disappearance of fauna usually marks the boundaries between time periods. The Carboniferous is separated from the early Devonian by the appearance of the Conodont, uh, Siphonodella, Sulcata, or whatever. So they use that as like an index fossil to differentiate these two times. But when we see the end of the Carboniferous, we see the, the end of these massive forests. We see the aridification of Pangaea. Pangaea, because of it, it's a supercontinent, this large interior is very arid. And the formation of large mountains as these tectonic plates collide prevents water from going inland. So you see the end of this global rainforest. You see this massive collapse of the rainforest in a short amount of time. And as a result, you have the dry, low, uh, relatively cool ice age conditions that we, go, that we see going into the Permian. Uh, the thing is, though, is that with this time period, we see the end of these lepidodendrons. We see the uh, dominance of conifers, ferns, horsetails, things that we associate, you know, cycads, whatever, things that we associate with this. The club mosses, they took a hit, but they're still around. The end, uh, the end Carboniferous did not really result in as devastating of a mass extinction as what will come later in the Permian. Just to set off, most of the forms that we see today survived the end of the Permian. But that's not really, that's not really the main debate that's being held here. The main debate is how did we get here and how do we move on? The Carboniferous is very fragmentary in terms of fossil remains. We still have a lot to find about the Carboniferous. We, we see all of the plants that we know of coming up in the Carboniferous and often being more diverse than they are now. Like the horsetail is way more diverse. We see the first conifers, the first gymnosperms, first ferns, first cycads. It's like it is the start. And we see here, it's like we can find trace fossils. Uh, we, we have huge welts of, of plant fossils, especially. But unfortunately, our, our remains for, for the fauna of that time are still relatively incomplete. So we see that the amphibians obviously survived. And the reptiles, they went on to do their thing and take over the planet. But... As we go into the Permian, we have to keep in mind, we as a scientific community, as a species, do not know how we got to the early Permian. By the time you get to the end of the Carboniferous, you have generated more questions than answers, definitively. And one of the issues now that we're having to face... Hey, what's up, David? One of the issues now that we're having to face is reconciling the current climate that we see with the Carboniferous. So what are people saying? It's like earth.org. The big scare is ocean acidification and a rise in CO2 levels bringing on disastrous climate change. At the end of the Carboniferous, we see this aridification take place, this 
reversal of the greenhouse earth take place as a direct result of tectonic plate shifting, as a result of the formation of Pangaea, or at least the aridification of the planet. We see in the fossil record all of these lepidodendrons being dominant right after this point, lepidodendrons not being dominant, being replaced mostly with conifers, ferns, and plants we actually mostly recognize today by, by the time you get to that boundary with the early Permian. So by 299 million years ago, we're starting to see an Earth that looks a lot more similar to what we have now. But this was not just, you know, the rainforest collapse happened, but this was a change that took millions of years. This was not like an asteroid coming from space. This was not like a massive volcanic eruption. This was a precipitous uh, extinction event that was resulting from the direct tectonic forces happening on Earth. And because of that, animals pr had a, had much more, I guess, more of a time to adapt to these changes and to, you know, switch things up. But in a lot of respects, animals just got smaller. Like the insects and the arthropods, for the most part, just downsized. They they didn't get that crushed, really, by the incarboniferous. They just, for some reason, didn't undergo the same radical physiological changes that the tetrapods underwent. And that's not explained. We, we don't have the explanation of how they develop the egg, how they develop scales, how they develop claws, what the impetus was for those when they weren't the dominant species on the planet. Were these, were these giving them some sort of competitive advantage in a moist, tropical, global rainforest? What was it giving them some advantage when we know that the largest animals were not these amniotes, that they, they, they were just small lizard-like gecko-like animals getting dominated by, by Timnus fondles and giant insects like Palmonoscorpius? So there's no explanation given. There's no, it's evolutionists want to sit here and talk about like, oh, well, it happened this way and this way and then they developed this and this. But isn't this all supposed to be based on impetuses given by natural selection? Isn't this all supposed to be based on things that can readily be identifiable as genuine impetus, as as a actual reason to become more sophisticated? Because what we're seeing in one direction is radical change, but not in the other. We see this radical change happen in plants between Cooksonia and the earliest gymnosperms. This also just took place in a few tens of millions of years. So what happened in the Carboniferous? What, what, was, the, what was the magical formula at, at the end of the Devonian and in the, to the mid-Carboniferous that allowed these animals to radically and magically shapeshift without any explanation given? Like, how did, how did insects even develop flight? How did, how did residual vestigial gill structures go uh, help not only just help them fly, but help them become some of the fastest and most effective flyers that we'd see until the pterosaurs. Mega Nura could, could fly as fast as a horse. Well, as a horse can run, I mean. And that just occurred in a few ten, tens of millions of years. That's, that's explainable by science, that, that an animal that was basically a, a, a log-dwelling tick is, is turning into this flying like eagle sized dragonfly, but can't, but somehow can't develop a more efficient respiratory system to go along with that. The entire air sacs helping the bird fly and yada yada. Just look at this. This system is the same system in the dragonfly. Why not a closed circulatory system, bro? Why not a larger heart with more chambers, bro? Why not, you know, air sacs are more concentrated in the single areas so that they're more efficient, bro? Basic changes. You, you can grow wings out of your back, but you can't grow a more efficient re uh, respiratory system. Uh, but science says, you know, science says that that selection pressure should have definitely been there. It was there for these plants. They, they apply that to tetrapods. They apply that to conifers. They apply that to everything. So they find all these carbon deposits. They find all these plants, all of these, all of these pollen grains, all these very diverse fish species that radiate out. So they say, one of the reasons that this indicates that amphibians moved away from water was in order to conquer terrestrial ecosystems. This was due to the development of amniotic egg. Not true. Again, this isn't true. This is, again, why you don't go to, like, regular pop sites. Because if you actually go back over here, you will see the most dominant animals on land. Look at this. Padera base. 3 to 48, 3 to 47. Lower stage. That big. Way bigger than any other. It's, it's like one meter long making an average size for an early tetrapod. This is an amphibian. This is straight up amphibian. This is, there's, the amniotic egg had nothing to do with conquering land. 
the largest animals on land at that time were all amphibians, all laying tadpole eggs in water and waiting for them to hatch. So even by that source, it's it's obviously wrong. And then UC Berkeley doesn't even try to give an explanation. The only explanation to give it is like, oh, well, it was this was due to the development of the amniota egg. But no explanation is given for where the egg came from. How it how it emerged, like what what genes uh, were activated to make it's it's just it just happened. One of the highlights is the appearance of the first amniotic egg and the first reptiles. So reptiles are thought to have evolved from existing amphibians. And that happened just once and never happened again. We had amphibians ever since, but we never saw reptiles. Thanks to the emergence of the amniotic egg, an egg that is protected and isolated from an external environment, so it calcifies, uh, it helped the uh, embryos and protected and will improve evolution. Thanks to the adaptation of it. So it improves evolution. If, if you actually look at like chicken, uh, what is it, uterus, and you see all of the parts that go in. So this is perfect. So this is how eggs work, by the way, in, in case people didn't know just how miraculous this is. Yeah. So higher oxygen levels allow the insects to get bigger, but the insects did not as the oxygen levels decline, develop a more efficient respiratory system like the tetrapods had been doing since they were lungfish. Uh, maybe the plan of the research that gave change to the animal. Yeah, but the thing is, is that evolutionists don't believe that. You know, you, you can, you can. I mean, being open-minded, like, that's what we want. We want novel ideas like this. But that, this, they will say your, your BS, this is straight up just natural selection doing its thing. This is, this is Darwinism at its finest. Just natural selection, bro. Natural selection, maybe a bit of sexual selection, but it's natural selection, bro. That that is the official explanation given for this. If you want to say like, oh, maybe it was a plant, like maybe uh, there was uh, there was a plant. It's like it it was irritating to the skin. They developed scales so they weren't as irritated. That claws helped them grip it onto trees to access this plant resource. And maybe it came from like a coevolution with a certain type of plant or uh, to hunt a certain type of insect. And that's how they developed everything. The problem, of course, is is that according to their own like structure of how evolution works it's just like it developed the mutations and was selected for and then it developed another mutation that was selected for so it had the genetic component it had the genotype mutation to allow for this selection to eventually lead to scales and eggs but there's no explanation given for how it got there like what's the selective pressure to create eggs in a global rainforest ecosystem where timnospondyls are dominant if timnospondyls are dominant and it shows that animals going back to the water to lay their eggs isn't a huge benefit. You know, it's, 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 oh, it's, oh, they have to go back. They lay their eggs. It works. It works. It's an, it isn't a huge benefit, but it works. The amniote egg, again, a same thing. It's like, is it really that much of a benefit? If laying eggs in the water works perfectly fine for almost the entire carboniferous, except for the very end. And then eggs magically develop out of thin air. You know, these, amp these other amphibians don't go away, but the amniote egg emerges to make things more efficient, to help evolution. But that doesn't apply to insects and it doesn't apply to all these other clades. It just, it just, it just happens. But what I want to highlight, yeah, you can't get an egg without certain genes or basic blocks to make an egg. You need proteins to change it. Exactly. And these genes have to come about through mutation and then be selected for and then accumulate over generations. So the genes that appear for the egg, all of them either have to appear at once for, for the egg to be fully calcified in one generation. I'm about to show you all the processes that go into making a chicken egg. Yeah, human size. I, I would love that if it was true. If, if there actually was some arthropod that radically changed its uh, respiratory system, like what they say happened in tetrapods, then I'd be all for finding human sized spider. But look here. So you start with the ovary. You know, the... the the chicken cloacus kiss, the cloacal kiss, transform, uh, transfers sperm uh, to the to the ovum, and and this is in the ovary. So the ovaries will release ova, they will release eggs, and those get fertilized by the sperm. There's the infundium and the magnum. So this is where the egg starts, basically as yolk, uh, or a little tiny egg thing. It will then accumulate yolk. It'll accumulate white. It'll slowly deposit calcium carbonate 
on its shell. And then eventually you get to the shell gland, which finish, finishes depositing the calcium, and then it gets pulsed through the vent. So if you look at amniote egg, so if you actually look at the amniote egg, this is a highly complex structure. So you see the vitellus, you see this air pocket here. You see the actual embryo, you see the amnion, the allentois, the shell. This, this shell is gas permeable to some extent. It's like there's a lot that is going into the creation and formation of this egg. They say like, oh, well, all, most of this is already here. And they just developed the shell around it. Okay, cool. You developed the shell around it. Awesome. How did you get all the structures to develop that shell? It's like they just act like it just happens. But you that's not how it works. It's like, did they it's like did they have a shell gland? Did they have an is like how did their actual reproductive system work? Because again, it's like not just because they're like, oh well, with insects, like, oh, they could adapt in some areas but not in others. Well, tetrapods could radically change every single system in their body, their endocrine system, the reproductive system, cardiovascular system, uh, respiratory system, skeletal system, muscular system, um, neurologic, everything. Like I mentioned before, they've changed every major system in their body, including the reproductive system to create eggs again. So they, they modify the reproductive system again in order to in order to lay eggs. And we are assuming that these eggs hatch and they're rather precocial. Like they're actually like lizards and stuff today where they don't hatch out as tadpoles, but also hatch out fully grown. That all has to be encoded too. So so think about how we got here today. It's like, oh, well, they could have taken baby steps but how? You you still needed all the genes to make an amniote egg. You need all the biological structures for the formation of the egg and laying of the egg and the life history behaviors to uh, care for the egg, to incubate the egg. You can't just lay it lay an egg and walk away. You, know, you have to have a system of incubation. So it's like all of these complex behaviors have to emerge along with the egg in order for this egg to work. All it's it's just like with the formation of the eye. It's like you have there's an irreductible complexity to egg laying that isn't explainable by just like, oh well, it just helps them adapt to an arid environment, bro. What 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 is there to it? So it's like this isn't too much. And I point to the lungs, I'm like, you know, it's it, this is this isn't too much to swallow. But if you look at just gradual mutation over time plus selection, this isn't too much to swallow. But oh man, coming coming back over here, this. Changing this, like, oh, man, you're crazy. You're crazy. You're crazy. 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 Uh, insect with closed circulatory system and an enlarged heart and, you know, reduced number of air sacs that are enlarged. That's crazy talk. Crazy. They can't do that. You're crazy. Evolution wouldn't do that, man. It'll, it'll do everything else, but you're, I mean, you're crazy. And that that's where we're at. It's like this is where we're at in academia, where, where you're getting this stuff shoved down your throat. But if you actually take a solid look... At what's going on? See, and here, here's, here's how this explains. Ovary follicles and funium place for reception of the ovulated egg cell for fertilization. That's 15 to 30 minutes. So there's time windows. Time windows on all of this. Then it goes into the magnum. Synthesis and deposition of proteins, the albumin. So that is where the albumin gets deposited. That's two to three hours. So it needs two to three hours to do that. Then in the isthmus, the synthesis of the two shell membranes in the chicken egg two to three hours. And keep in mind, in almost every single egg-laying species, it does not get much simpler than this. Like, the chicken, you might think, oh, well, early egg -layer. Like, no, dude. It's basically this complex from the start. The uterus, the synthesis of the shell, that's also known as the, the shell gland that I showed you earlier, and then uh, the opening of the cloaca, and yeah, basically the passing of that egg. All of these structures have to exist. Every single one of them has to exist at the exact same time, they have to emerge at the exact same time in the same generation in order for this to make sense. They all have to perform the same roles. It all has to work flawlessly because if it doesn't, the animal doesn't reproduce. The animal doesn't lay a viable egg. You, you have to have every single part of the egg be there or it's not going to work. You have to have this entire system work. But the emergence of it is a complete mystery. They say, oh, it's, it's getting more arid. So it just magically, like evolves it just magically develops the ability to lay hard eggs because because it's convenient for your theory it, and this is the brick wall man like this is the brick wall of academia it's like you point this out to somebody 
and they will sit there and be like, well, I, I, I am an expert. And I hear this from professors like I am an expert. I've been studying this for 15 years. And I always want to point out, it's like, well, you didn't study it enough. It's like, I, I point out, it's like, you genuinely think this is just, oh, the amniotic egg just emerged. It just emerged out of thin air. This entire system, every single part of the system came about and worked flawlessly from the very start, from the very first generation it happened. And you're like, oh, it's a slow buildup. I'm like, well, at a certain point, you had to lay a fully functioning viable egg. You can't half-ass an egg. It has to either be an egg that can hold an embryo and has all the hallmarks of an egg, or it isn't an egg. It's like, oh, it can be partially calcium. It's like, no, this is not how this works. So it's like the amniotic egg. We have proof of the amniotic egg. This egg is the amniotic egg emerging and no explanation given. Not an explanation given by Berkeley, not any explanation given for for any of it. It says, which allowed for further exploitation of the land. Lay eggs without fear of desiccation. But because, even though it like prevents their eggs from desiccating, they now have to take care of those eggs. They have to, they have to become intelligent enough and, and complex enough to know how to, you know, care for eggs on land. It's like, how did all these behaviors, how did such a radical change to its life history develop? But the thing is, is that it's all speaking of, speaking of like, yeah, paranormal activity. Speaking of bro, it's like the boiling frog. If you try to explain this to people, and this is why this works, this discussion works, because if you're, if you're so used to, to the idea of evolution, like think of a dog or you, you get taught microevolutionary principles that make sense. These small changes within a species that can help it ad adapt to a niche. Eventually, like they really try to tell you, oh, we'll just apply more time to it. apply more time and you can have shape shifting fish and you can have monkeys becoming people because look at these changes in the Galapagos finches. They basically boiling frog themselves into believing that this entire trend in just 45 million years that went from lungfish like literal actual lungfish like we have today to agama like lizards and the earliest synapsid whatever relatives that that all just came about because of natural selection there is no magical plant no nothing it's like straight up the same principles that they used to explain like why Galapagos finches had different beak shapes. Now it's explaining the origins of all terrestrial vertebrates. And it's being wound out in a time period that doesn't even make sense based on assumptions that aren't explained by science. So you're having a pseudoscientific discussion about the origins of life on land, and you can't even explain major fundamental aspects of your theory as it pertains to some of the most radical events to ever happen okay well amniotic egg boom came there that was great that it's like okay so where did that come what was the build up to it and they don't know they, they shrug their shoulders and yet the same breath they will tell you with full confidence where all of life comes from yeah so it's a mutation like okay it's a mutation that occurred right so this mutation occurred that allowed all this to happen and these mutations accumulating is what led to the amniotic egg what's funny about this though is that the amniotic the irreductible complexity of the amniotic egg presents a challenge because you can't cut out any one of these processes you need the deposition of the albumin you need the synthesis of the shell membranes for gas exchange you need the synthesis of the actual hard shell to prevent desiccation. You need the infundium because the eggs need to be fertilized. And some of these structures are hangovers from the earlier reproductive system. But this is still complete overhaul of the reproductive system. When you look at the lungs, that's still a complete overhaul. Go back here, still a complete overhaul of what lungfish were using. Just something to help aid them in a low oxygenated environment is the bedrock upon which we have the alveoli and even the unidirectional breathing system based on air sacs. The diaphragm, all of this, we see further innovations in the tetrapod breathing system, zero in the insect and arthropod breathing systems. Even today, isopods still you still need to keep their 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 lungs moist, basically. They're 
their book lungs moist. So it's like, why, why didn't we see this? We, we didn't see that at all. And so the idea of like, oh, it was a mutation. There's plenty of mutations going around. The question is, how did these mutations just miraculously lead to these beautiful, complex, intricate structures in what's had to be just a couple generations? Like you couldn't have a radical transition because then you'd have something called outbreeding depression, where certain traits, especially intermediate traits, prevent animals from actually being successful in terms of reproduction and survival. So for example, if you have outbreeding depression, let's say you have two different sized finches, they interbreed, they produce a medium sized finch, and that finch is no longer good at picking up small seeds, no longer that good at picking up large seeds, and is getting outcompeted by the smaller and larger specimens. That prevents hybridization from wiping out these two clades, there's a negative selection pressure against those hybrids. So if you see this, it's like what happens in genetics, okay, I have the mutation, right? I have the mutation and let's say it works perfectly in the first generation. I have all of these and they're all dominant and I pass them on. What happens if, you know, the gene I have, it's like, what if I inherit a gene for uh, a shellless uterus? What, what if I have all these genes, but I don't have the uterus gene? It, it basically means that it's irrelevant to my fitness now. Like I can, I can have everything and I can have the infomedium, the magnum, the isthmus, but it's like, I'm missing the shell gland. Like I don't have the gene to deposit the shell. Good luck. Or I have the gene to deposit the shell, but I don't have the gene for the isthmus. Good luck. It's like, that's how mutation works. Mutation is completely random and it's completely miraculous. The actual chances of having a mutation that affects you like this, it has to not only be a mutation in the germ cell, but then it has to be a mutation that occurs precipitously from generation to generation and accumulates. What we see in animals is an accumulation of mutations over time. So it's like one mutation occurs and like you're golden, right? But then that mutation has to be combined with further mutations. You not only need the mutation for the deposition of the calcium, you also need the mutation for the de deposition of the albumin. You need all of this system to work flawlessly the first time, or you're not going to have it affect your fitness in a beneficial way. It's all about the balance and natural selection according to their own system. It is the balance of that which can confer a benefit versus that which incurs a cost. When you have a neutral thing, like let's say this doesn't provide, like let's say you just pop out, like you have three of the five genes necessary to make an egg, for example, and you just, it, it doesn't, that doesn't affect your fitness. Like unless it helps you lay more eggs or something, you're, it's not going to affect your fitness. Those genes aren't going to give you a benefit. They're not going to be positively selected for. They could be lost. They could be fit. Who knows? But what we do know is that it, once you get to the amniote egg, all of these structures are in place. Not a single one is missing. So, yeah, so it's like, it almost is like it's encoded in the DNA. One of the things that we have to reconcile is the fact that DNA in its very nature seems to be a sort of template or scaffold. It's a form of programming that is biological. And if we think about it in a, in a logical way, there has to be some complete code that comes in here and affects it. It's like if you have incomplete code, like it's bugged, it doesn't matter. It's not going to execute. It's nothing's going to happen. If you if you have two lines of code and you need three, it doesn't matter if you have those two lines of code. It doesn't matter if those two lines of code line up perfectly and work. And it's like, oh man, these two lines of code, they're great. Like I have everything. And you miss that extra line of code. Error. Error message pops right out. Doesn't matter if you're using Python, C++. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. If you're missing that line of code, it doesn't matter. And this is all that matters. What matters is fitness. What matters is the number of offspring you produce and the genotype you pass on to them. That is everything in the in the process of evolution. And no matter what amniote you go to, it's like chicken, chicken, chicken. I could go to crocodile. Let's let's try crocodile. This 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 might be. Okay, let me see my safe search. Is my is my safe search okay? I need my safe search to be like strict. Okay. So, again, avian female anatomy. So that's that's just more avian. I'm I'm like being very selective here, but it's like it doesn't matter. It's like you you go and you look at any of these creatures. You look at the uterus of any like amniotic egg. This, this is what they mean by the amniotic egg. This does not change. And this is cool. Like, yeah, it's okay when you can be wrong, but that's the whole thing about science. 
The only thing that becomes wrong is when people sit there from a place of authority and claim that they have the answers. That, oh, human beings and tetrapods and mammals, they came from this animal. And it's like Neil Shubin claiming that Tiktaalik is like, oh, well, Tiktaalik represents the first species to transition onto land. But what we obviously see here is that people are sitting on a throne of hubris and dictating to the masses what is and isn't correct. It's like they're modern cultists. They're people preaching from a pulpit that are claiming that they have the answers to the origins of life. It's like they sit there like medical, medical healing. But so if you look at the, this is also a good image. Unlike the eggs of amphibians and fish, the amniotic egg of reptiles, birds, and monotremes is internally fertilized through sexual contact, has a protective outer membrane or a shell that prevents drawing out, contains enough nutrients for the nook to nourish the embryo, the alentois is the sac that holds waste until the embryo hatches, and also provides some oxygen. That all appeared at the same time, ladies and gentlemen. That all appeared at the same time. It's okay. It's okay to... It's it's okay to say you don't know in science. It's okay to say who who knows, but they don't want to say who knows. That's the issue. Is like they want to sit there on a, on a pulpit and say, "Oh yeah, this is believable. Oh, it is a gradual thing, you know, a little bit of." Uh. But it's like no. What we see is that we have amniotic eggs in the fossil record. There's no half amniotic egg. There's not the pseudo amniotic egg. It's the amniotic egg. But this is what's irreconcilable for so many scientists is that they can't let go of a theory upon which they built their entire ideology and way of looking at the world. They, they point, they look at a plot holes that occur throughout these periods of history. And this is why I'm going so deep in the carboniferous is because it's just so egregious. Like, yeah, we can look at the Devonian and be like, okay, there's shape-shifting use of an optron, but to be like so blatantly BS like to your face, because you can't admit that you're, that you, that you fell for like the macro evolution scam that you're just going to sit here and be like, oh yeah, this makes total sense that all the structures, like internal fertilization. Like, so you have to basically evolve sex and the egg. You have to, you have to evolve sex. You, you have to evolve uh, the ability to eternally fertilize. You have to know how much nutrients to put in your yolk. I mean, yeah, okay, that's a holdover from the amphibian days, you can say. But what about the what, what about the What about the fusion of the two membranes? What about the structures that we just covered that allowed that to happen. What about what about all these structures here that allow this to occur? That all has to appear in one, at one generation, generation one, the generation before the egg, generation after the egg. So that's this is what it comes down to. People obfuscate this over the millions of years, millions of years it took, oh millions of years. But what it really comes down to is the innovation. It didn't take decades to come up with the steam engine. To take decades to come up with the automobile. It didn't take decades to come up with the airplane. People were tinkering with it, but it was one innovation that ultimately, it was a one aha moment that gave us the airplane, that gave us the automobile, that gave us the steam engine. It, it, it's those, mo even, even like beer and agriculture, it's like, it's the aha moment. You can have tinkering, you can have experimentation, but it takes that aha moment for it to work. That aha moment, they don't want to apply it to science because they realize how ridiculous it sounds to convince people that this all came about in one generation or to convince people it came about like, oh, it just all just came together at once and it just worked perfectly. That's not how science works. We don't know. But there is that claim. There is that assumption that we should just swallow it because millions of years plus natural selection will give us whatever we want to see in the fossil record. Whatever theory we want to make, whatever explanation we want to give, it's all explainable by natural selection and mutation. No matter how far-fetched and how convoluted, no matter how miraculous or how honestly inexplicable, it can be explained away by animals' survival of the fittest and reproduction rates and their base mutation plus selection. It's just, there is a limit. There is a limit to the evolutionary Darwinistic argument. And this is it. When you go back in time and you look at these miraculous events, these inexplicable phenomenon, radical physiological change of animals from different between niches a complete change of lifestyle a complete change of everything that this animal con constitutes and you're fine explaining it away via natural selection telling us that lungfish became lizards in less time it took small horses to become big horses 
in less time it took fully terrestrial animals to to go back to the water. It's like at that in that much time, you're 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 seeing you're seeing these creatures radically and physically shape shift into new animals. It's just it's bonkers. It's it's beyond bonkers to think that Darwin explaining why finches have different beak shapes and different sizes and colors on the Galapagos Islands would turn into people sitting here and claiming that oh yeah you know well insects couldn't do it but and but lizards could the most diverse and most dynamic species on earth couldn't radically change its respiratory system but tetrapods not only could do that but they could do the same to every other system in their body even though we don't see that today even though we didn't see the amniotic egg or reptile skin and any of that emerge again in amphibians yeah and yeah, bro. It's all coming together. And I'm actually going to have my next uh, sex quest video next week. I'm going to I'm going to alternate it. But yeah, that's basically what the Carboniferous is going to be. I think I I think I went in on everything I wanted to touch on the Carboniferous. So yeah, and as you as you may be able to tell, the uh, the Carboniferous did end with that mass aridification. People talk about oh, it's this ma it wasn't really a mass extinction. It was more like a massive like habitat conversion it wasn't this radical sudden thing that occurred that the the rainforest collapse took place as pangea formed it took millions of years at least two to three solid million years for for this to really occur and if you and it was again a slow gradual process of lowering oxygen lowering co2 uh, lowering global temperatures, the shifting of Gond Gondwana northwards and these other continents southwards until you got Pangaea. And that sets you up basically for the Permian, the, the colder, more arid ice age earth that the Permian was. But we still look back on the Carboniferous and it's a blip. Like people don't cover the Carboniferous. If you notice in school, you probably never learned about the Carboniferous. The Carboniferous is where we get our coal and where our petroleum, but they don't want to dig deep into the Carboniferous period precisely because it evokes all of these uncomfortable questions about the origins of life. It, it invokes all these un, unspeakable and unexplicable questions that people will naturally have about where lizards came from, where mammals came from, where all these animals on land came from, all these different types of plant, all these different types of insect, all these different, like vertebrates and vertebrates, plants, fungi, they all radically diversified in the Carboniferous. It's like the Cambrian explosion, but on land. And we saw the same thing in the Ordovician. We saw the same thing in the Cambrian. We see these cycles of creation and destruction, the fossil record, and we're so quick to explain them away. But we don't really know what we're talking about. We don't have any real evidence for the things that in academia people are saying but they're publishing papers, they're getting letters after their names, they're writing dissertations based on unsubstantiated, completely ego-driven science, logic. But it's difficult, man. We got... Yeah, it's, it's the slow progressive chain. Like they say the transition from ape to human, that chart that they show you is exaggerated, but that's still the formal and widely accepted way that we believe life got onto land. That chain of creatures slowly accumulating traits to get to the modern derived terrestrial organism is exactly what we, we see in modern scientific literature. Yeah, the, the thing about the absurdly long periods of time though, it's, it's not just the, the long periods of time, it's the short periods of time where we see radical species change, where we see radical morphological and genetic and physiological change. Like I mentioned earlier, we, we see this transition from, like, let's say, let's say Eusthenopteron and all the traits it took to get to Tiktaalik, like not even a fully terrestrial animal, uh, and they claim it's a transitional fossil transitional in what respect it's because we're trying to take this earlier time period and reconcile it with our notion of time and so it's transitioning it's like oh well it's an intermediate form between later forms that we know of tiktaalik doesn't know that tiktaalik's just existing in its environment so tiktaalik doesn't doesn't get it tiktaalik's just doing its thing it's specialized for a certain ecosystem it's not transitional 
it's a fully specialized organism filling a, a, a riparian or freshwater niche and it's doing its thing. It's not trying to become a land-based animal. It's not trying to go back to the sea. It's trying to survive. It's trying to dominate that niche. For animals, the life history of an animal is dominated very much by the present. The bias that we have by compensating for our inability to understand the deep past is to apply these same lengths of time and incomprehensibility to obfuscate events and phenomena that even though it had a buildup of a million years, took place in a very short amount of time. So we can say like, oh, it's a hard, it's hard to comprehend 385 million years ago. It's hard to comprehend even 1 million years or 100,000 years. But when we look at the base mutation rate of animals, when we look at uh, the, the amount of allele accumulation, allele change that occurs, that's novel, that's a sign of evolution, it's a sign of mutation, that happens at such a slow rate. Mutations occur, especially positive mutations, occur at such a low rate in animals that it honestly helps us kind of clear up and un, you know, unmess up all of this time that we're having to play with because it, it happens so gradually. And we see this. We see that allele change, allele frequency change occurs very gradually in animals. Base mutation rate is not high in invertebrates. It's not high even in invertebrates. Most animals have a certain element of genetic conservatism that honestly precludes mutation. They want to, for example, we have three redundant systems in our bodies to prevent UV radiation from damaging our cells. We say all the time, like, oh, well, maybe UV radiation was a reason why these animals were so diverse and got diverse so quickly. But then you actually look in actual animal cells and you see they have all these mechanisms to repair damage from UV radiation. We don't want mutation. Most mutation is decidedly negative, but mutations are a generational phenomenon. It doesn't take millions of years for a mutation to occur. That's, that's an assumptive falsehood. What's happening is that it takes one generation, one instance of replication for a mutation to occur. So even though it may have taken millions of years for this mutation to occur, it's a one generation event for the mutation. For mutation accumulation, like what we were talking about with the egg, that still is a spontaneous event. The mutation that led to the amniote egg had to happen and not only happen once, but get passed down. And then all these other mutations had to happen, or it just had to all work out, it just had to all work out at once. So it's like, it's easy to use millions of years and the incomprehensibility of millions of years to kind of like take this and be like, oh, well, it makes sense that we see these changes because it happened over 20 million years. But these changes weren't happening over 20 million years. These changes were periodic events of mutation that conferred either a benefit or so selected sexually or naturally that were then passed on within that gene pool. So whether or not that gene reaches fixation, which is 100% expression in every single individual, or whether it's lost, the, the allele is completely lost, is honestly most of the time pretty random. You can't say that just because an individual is larger, better, whatever, that it's gonna survive. Individually, the entire fitness thing it's hard to calculate. Again, like I said, you can be like the most Chad amphibian on the planet, but a rock drops on you and you're gone. And it's like, oh, maybe there was an insect that had a better uh, respiratory system, but it got eaten by a, by a fish. It's who knows. The thing is, though, is that using time, many people have obfuscated very ridiculous and far-fetched ideas in the fossil record and that pertains to the fossil record because their own ego and their own sense of academic achievement is predicated upon always being right, upon a publishing a paper that fully backs up exactly what their hypothesis was, and their ego cannot take a hit. They don't want to go back to the drawing board. They want their dissertation. They want their master's uh, thesis, whatever defended and done out of the way. They want that paper published. They want the acclaim of their peers. And so in a very natural process, human, human just basic human nature perverts and defiles the scientific method because one of the issues that we face now in modern science is not a lack of talent it's not a lack of understanding it's not a lack of ambitious people trying to change the world for the better what we're finding in modern academia is that politics and money and personal gain are directly influencing what people are putting out and what is reaching the public and that last part is crucial. What the public is getting exposed to is highly propagandized. A lot of what they're being exposed to with the carboniferous is not in context 
of where the amniotes came from. It's not in context of where the synapses came from. It's all about, oh, we can't, don't burn fossil fuels or we'll go back to having a hot human earth. Or no, it's like, it's, it's all being used. It's like, they're not pointing out the things that actually have scientific worth in the carboniferous. Instead, they solely highlight things that are relevant to like climate change. Or they specifically highlight things that are relevant to the emergence of the first tetrapod. They don't want to talk about how all the insects came about and all the arthropods came about. It's like first time you saw um, all these radical vascular plants that weren't Cooksonia coming about. It's like this was a time of massive biological radiation. And it's it's very similar to what we've seen in earlier periods. But yeah, it is like this. And I, I'm, I'm going to cover this. My, my Eocene, my Paleocene vid is going to be off the chain. Because that is where it's the most egregious. Where you see animals, like I said with horses, it took <laughs> like the, the transition between Eohippus to Equus is like 55 million years. It took us all this time to go from a horse the size of a Jack Russell Terrier with, with like what, four digits to like a single digit horse. And it's like animals don't exist for our convenience. You know, they don't change because we want them to change. They don't evolve just because our theories tell say that they should evolve. Like I said, it's like you take a crocodile from the the early Cretaceous and a modern American alligator, and I'll dare you to try to find the difference. I'll dare you. Like I'll I'll I'll, I'll do that when I actually get that section. I will show uh, one of the big part of that segment. I'm going to pull up a bunch of fossils and modern animals, and I'm going to dare you to try to find the difference between the two of them, because what we see a lot, especially with comparative anatomists, is uh yeah um radical evolutionary change for me, but not for thee. You know, they'll, they'll point to ankle morphology being like the origin, like, oh, the ankle morphology on Dorodon totally explains how we how we went from uh, a fully ter a fully terrestrial hoofed animal to a fully aquatic whale in just 10 million years. The amount of time, uh, less time it took than for yak and cattle to diverge, by the way. Same amount of time about they say that it took humans and chimps to diverge. You could go from a hoofed, a hoofed animal, a, a sheep relative, a, a literal ruminant to whales. And that's, that's like unironic. It's like, you know, even though they go and they bootstrap to a 77% confidence interval and it's really dubious, they still run with it. Why? Because it generates attention. It's, it's attention grabbing. It's about the money. It's not about the science. They want the money. Yeah. I, I, I got, I, I love MGTOWN for, for giving me that shout out, but yeah. And, and realize I'm not sitting here saying this stuff just to be a hater. You know, I'm not sitting here saying this and, and claiming anamorphs. Well, yeah, it's logically not sound, but people need to understand the reason this is getting pushed is because of a specific agenda. They want a certain message and a certain ideology to be dominant. If, if you go back to my big bang rant uh, after I got into like a spat with Professor Dave Explains, uh, that whole thing stemmed from the fact that Professor Dave called me stupid and scientifically illiterate. Because I critiqued his video where he just went in on this plasma cosmo cosmologist, like Eric Leitner, whatever his name is. But it's like, he, he was basically like, my theory that has no scientific support, the Big Bang, is better than your theory with no scientific support, plasma cosmology, because I'm smart and you're dumb. I'm big, you're little. You're a p and it's like, he just went ad hominem the entire time. And I'm like, this is modern science. This, this guy, Professor Dave, has two degrees. He has a large following in YouTube, very successful YouTube channel. He's like a professor, an actual professor. And this is how he conducts a debate. This is how he presents his, his thoughts and opinions. Even if this is a clickbait channel, you're going to sit here and claim that your theory has no holes, that there's no objective way that somebody could sit there and say, oh, well, my way of seeing things might be flawed, but here's my take. No, it is you are wrong. You are scientifically illiterate you don't know what you're talking about not based on science not based on actual academic achievement but based purely on an insult to his own ego and that is modern academia right now in a nutshell it's not trying to teach people the truth it's not trying to teach people to think outside the box i mean right here in this chat you have ideas of like you know plants you know maybe that's this maybe it's that maybe it's that we're not the thing that's crazy is that we don't get that in modern academia anymore. We don't get people sitting around and spitballing, oh, what could have been the cause for this? What could have been the cause for that? It is like one mainstream theory, one mainstream explanation that some guy cooks up 
and you run with it. Like Neil Shubin is the architect for the transitional tiktolic. He's the architect for the transitional fossil. One guy, one guy named Neil Shubin is, is the, is the architect for all of that. And people don't know that people don't know. That's just like these one or two scientists. It's like Stephen Hawking and black hole theory. Everything we know about black holes came from one guy. It's like, we talk about cultists. We talk about people who make things about themselves, who, who let their ego drive them into claiming miraculous things that anybody from a mile away could see is pathological behavior. But we don't extend that to science. It's like we only with the pandemic did people finally start to like start questioning this. But it's like, think about before 2019, people blindly trusted what anybody with a lab coat and letters over their name said on national television. And even still to this day, people do it. People will blindly trust an expert or or somebody with credential. And it's like, you know, me having a degree doesn't make me any more right than somebody else, especially when it comes to like actual objective fact. You could you could be homeless and drug addiction, have no teeth and have nothing going on in your life. And you can still spit straight truth. You can still be Diogenes pilled. That doesn't change things. But we have a deliberate concerted effort to to radically change people's perception of how the world works. We don't want them to be religious. We don't want them to think outside the box. We don't want them to question. We don't want them to think critically. We need them to comply. We need them to think like how we think. And we need them to be smart and capable. So it's like, how do you get smart and capable and logical people to follow along? You make them feel stupid. You make them feel like there's such an overwhelming amount of evidence for what you believe, when in reality, what you're doing is cherry picking the facts so that they suddenly look like, oh, well, how can you even debate? People accuse me of doing the exact opposite. They, they accuse me of like, oh, well, you're just cherry picking things that don't work. I'm like, here's the thing. If I get into a car and I turn on the ignition and I release the emergency brake and the transmission doesn't work, dude, it doesn't matter if that emergency brake is pristine. doesn't matter if that ignition, if your spark plugs are great, if, you, if your transition's messed up, your car's not going to run, bro. Your car is busted. And I'm going to say it's busted. I don't give a crap how polished your leather seats are. I don't care how clean your dash is. I don't care if you have an internal computer, V8 engine. Your transmission doesn't work. Your car is busted. The burden of proof is always on the person claiming the miraculous. It's always on the person claiming that there's something that is going on. They have to prove it. If you say that we all came from lungfish and for if, if, if that lungfish to to reptiles is a 45 million year transition the burden of proof is on you to prove that and they say like oh well look at the fossil record i'm like well the fossil record doesn't tell me that this is even possible if you look at the modern base mutation rates of amphibians and reptiles it does not correlate with a 45 million year time fr time frame modern amphibians for example often have larger genomes the largest genomes among among vertebrates people don't know that salamanders have a way bigger genome than humans they have some of the biggest genomes ever and so people say like, oh, well, they have all this rare genetic, like all this rarefied genetic material, but it's like you actually look at the genes and it's like redundancies for this and things to resist certain types of toxins. And their genome is completely and utterly specialized for completely different behaviors. But you'll still see people who like have a surface level knowledge of a certain area of a field make a grandiose claim. People are like, oh, great. Thanks for coming to my TED talk and then moving on. And it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And they're, again, who is paying them? It's not, yeah. It's just a version of science that looks for the truth. That is science. Unfortunately, what we see today is a lack of science. It's, it's like there's nothing more unscientific than, than sitting here and, and claiming that you know the ends and beginnings of the universe. Remember, at no point in any part of my critique series, after all the videos I've made, have I ever made a claim as to the origins of life or as to the origins of the universe. It's unknowable. It's unknowable. You can't know these things. It's impossible to know these things. But for some reason, we're living in a society where these people are fully confident telling you like, oh yeah, eggs ah, happen because the weather. Ah. And to me, I just, I find that encourageable because who's listening to this? The people listening to it are kids. The people listening to this are young professionals, people who are going to begin their entire careers. And again, they're getting paid. 
that it's like you're getting paid to find certain results. Are you going to get funding if you come up in your hypothesis like, well, I thought it was going to be like whatever, but it wasn't. And yeah, sorry, I guess I'll try again. It's like you're not going to get grant funding. It's like they want results. They want something flashy. They want something that'll uh, that'll get headlines. They want something to publish in their journal. But unfortunately, that's just not how life works. And if you actually want to do good science, you're going to have your hypothesis not come up correct. You're going to have to go out and explore. And that's why back in the times, back in the day, it's like you need guys like Antoine Lavoisier, guys like Isaac Newton, they had personal wealth. These guys had enough money to mess around and do whatever. It's like actual science takes money. And because money is such an integral part of it, there is an impetus to justify the money spent. And because of that need for justification, you get people fudging things. You get issues in methodology. And this is why the replication crisis exists. All of these studies that can't be replicated precisely because people are unable to do legitimate work. They want that snappy headline. They want to get published in the journal Nature. They want to get uh, more accreditations. They want their thesis. To, they want their thesis defense to go swimmingly. So what are they going to do? They're going to say all the right things and mention all the right prompts that'll give them brownie points with their professors and proctors when the time comes to do this. And that's why academia, especially in the West, is slowly becoming a joke. It's becoming more and more dogmatic and less and less innovative, and less and less diverse in terms of people's thoughts and opinions. You will hear the same sentences, the same claims, the same phrasing even from scientist to scientist to scientist to scientist. And it's all the same recycled, shared around garbage, not a unique thought in the heads of any of these people. And it's ridiculous. And yeah, it's cult-like behavior. So it is ironic. There is a, a very poignant irony to the idea that people who are so divorced and secular from the, from the spiritual, from, from the ideas of spirituality, place so much faith in their own assumptions. It's, it's not even like a belief in a higher being. It's like you believe in a process. It's like you believe in natural selection. And yeah, it's, so it's easy to understand the situation. The unknown is scary, but the unknown to that, the unknown is scary in an existential sense, sure, but the unknown is also career ending for people who are expected to be experts, people who are expected to be professionals in this field, because you can study something for 25 years, but eventually you're going to reach, reach the limits of human knowledge. And you as a scientist, it is your obligation to push the limits, push the limits of human understanding in order to reach new ground. The issue is, is that you reach that new ground with baggage. It's like going into a new relationship after you just broke up with your ex. It's like you have all of this ideological baggage from how you have already formulated your way of viewing the world. And now you're expected to provide an unbiased and objective inference about what you see. And you'll see it. The conclusions to a lot of these papers, if you go into like seven days of science, like Benji Thomas, great channel, highly recommend it. But it's like you go to the papers that these people publish and in the inferences, they're like, we think this is a basal such and such that derived from the such and such. And it probably uh, was the progenitor of later. I'm like, you don't know that. You found like the jawbone of a Displetosaurus and, and, and you found some other like piece of its skull. And they're like, oh, well, this is an intermediate specimen. And it looks uh, intermediate between these. And it's like you're literally just comparing bones. Like you don't have this animal's genetic code. It's like you're using pure morphological comparison which you know doesn't work. It's like you, you would take a Clark's Greb and a Western Greb. You take a, a scaled quail and a gambles quail. You take, I mean, you even takes different species of pheasant. It's like in real life, things look completely different. Look at their skeletons, almost exactly the same. And it's like, that's the issue with comparative anatomy. It's like, people have to understand, people will acknowledge. It's like, oh, you can't just look at if two animals look the same. It's like, there's all these, all, and you know, a ton of things that can go ha like happen with an animal. It could, spontaneous they can have fewer teeth more teeth but it's like they they will write entire genuses or orders off of dentition alone like they found a tooth new species it's like okay guys why is why are they doing that it's like they're not just trying to be malicious they're just trying to get clout they're trying to get acclaim and fame 
So it's like, yeah, one part of it is like a basic human explanation, but a big part of it, this is why it's oftentimes so convoluted, is trying to cherry pick the fossil record. Only 2% of biota is even represented in the fossil record. And it gets more and more sparse the farther back you go. But it's like, you've got this fossil record. You've got all of this data. And instead of being like, well, this is a mess, we're going to try to make some sense of it. That's a, that's a human thing to do. But what's also human is to want to be the guys like organizes this. It's like, oh, well, that guy said it like this. I'm going to say it like that. And so in early science is like, you know, Othniel, Charles Marsh and the Bone Wars, you've got this competitive spirit. Competition made things go well. But academia has now made it to where you won't progress in academia as a field. You won't progress and be taken seriously as a consultant. You, you will be a pariah if you break apart from the herd, if you break apart from the collective understanding, you could have a full understanding of the mechanics of evolution. You have a full understanding about the mechanics of, of geological formation and tectonic activity. You could go in on this and you'll still be discredited because they have their entire reputations on the line. The reason that Professor Dave had that big autistic rant um, against against plasma cosmology and was insulting people like me in the comments is because to attack his opinion, attack his assessment is to attack his intelligence. And if he has to then compensate, just like many other academics, by discrediting people with objective facts. And that's what's happening all over. It's happening in politics. It's happening in the media. It's happening in day-to-day -day lives with people. It happens in business. It's like never outshine the master. You're not supposed to be asking uncomfortable questions in science. You're just supposed to trust the people who know, the people who are experts. And there's this weird appeal to authority, logical fallacy going on right now, where people who notice things are being discredited solely because they haven't been indoctrinated to the same extent these people. It's like, oh, well, if you if you had the same indoctrination that I did, then you'd believe like me. And it's like, that's not an argument. It's really not. Yep. It's, it's, and again, the funniest thing too, it's like it's the same thing with climate, like pointing back to all of the climate predictions, like the three times they predicted peak oil, the famines in the nineties, they predicted the mass freezing that they were expecting to occur in the eighties out and more famously Al Gore saying that Vanuatu, Palau, Kiribati, and the coast of Florida would be underwater by 2018. It's like, you can point to very recent examples of scientists, scientists uh, using their expertise to predict the future. And I kind of pointed this out too. In fact, the spat I got in with Professor Dave all started with uh, me saying, it's funny how we can, that we can predict the beginning. We can honestly tell people what happened at the beginning of the universe, but we cannot predict the weather two weeks in advance. You know, it's, it's funny. These guys can predict the heat death of the sun and of the entire universe. They can predict when the sun's going to explode. But God forbid they, they try to figure out when the rain's going to end in California. That's that's just a who done it. You know, my power can't stay on if, if the wind blows too hard. But these people are going to tell me what it takes to become a Kardashev one civilization. It's and, and, and also remember the uh, the lead, the lead in a uh, in the gasoline. That's that's another big one. That's another one where they're like, oh, yeah, it makes the gas that makes the car run better. All that all that lead in the gasoline. But realize the the money trail leads somewhere every time oh, my facial hair is so itchy every time you get to a place where you have to sit down and be like who's making money off this that's a bad sign like for any organization where you have to wonder like is this guy saying this because he's getting money from somebody and unfortunately in science that's kind of where we're at now it's no longer a question of am i actually like, am I actually telling people the truth? Am I actually giving people something that is explicable? Or am I simply just furthering my own agenda? And people people won't actually sit down and ask themselves these hard questions. Is Michio Kaku, is Neil deGrasse Tyson, is Bill Nye the science guy? Are all these people I look up to, the Sagans, the Hawkins, the Dawkins? I mean, people who you really admire. Like, you have to sit back and say, like, is this person actually here for the right reasons? 
is is Sagan here be, because he wants to enlighten me about the world, or is he trying to sell this book? You know, is Stephen Hawking here telling me about black hole theory because he wants me to genuinely become curious in astronomy, or is he trying to sell this book? He's like, is Neil deGrasse Tyson over here, uh, you know, making posts on Twitter about, you know, people like, oh, you're, you know, it's like getting into arguments with people on Twitter. Neil deGrasse Tyson, like, you know, aren't you supposed to be trying to enlighten people about the wonders of the cosmos? But you're over here defending your ego. So what I what I'm seeing is a large amount of personal hypocrisy occurring with people who are questioning everything. Oh, we got to question everything, guys, unless it's questioning me. Unless you're trying to question me, in which case I'm going to point out all of these things I have over you. Uh, you're you're a pleb, you're a peon, you're a layman. You just don't get it. But what they fail to understand is that because of the boiling frog phenomenon, when you're outside of the boiling pot and you've been simmering in academia for 30 years and you just don't understand how ridiculous you sound, like all these people, like mentioning the whales and the artiodactyl thing, it's like you don't understand how ridiculous you sound to people who are sane, rational human beings. When you say that whales came from sheep relatives, you sound utterly brainwashed. You, you sound so wacky. It's like, again, like a, the cult comparison, walking out of an insane cult. It's like trying to spit Scientology at a guy on the street. He'll call you insane. He'll call you insane. It's like, what are you talking about? It's like, coming up to somebody and being like, oh yeah, bro. Uh, you know, it's, it's like the first person to say like, oh, humans came from monkeys. Huge debate, huge debate. So like when they found Australopithecus, when they found the Lucy specimen, they're like, oh, it's like a chimp from the waist up, but it's like a person from the bottom down, you know, instead of it just being an upright chimp, it's the ancestor of all people. And it's like, that just started it. It's like ever since anthropologists just been a mess because anthropologists, they fell for the same poison. All Human, all hominin fossils can fit in a five gallon bucket, just little fragments of jawbone, little orbital here or there. And they're building entire clades and family trees and saying like, oh, the human family tree is, you should see it. It's like this weird tangled tree because they can't make up their minds about anything. It's hilarious. But I mean, dude, I mean, we know from history, we know from history that <laughs> there's massive science like nicole people always look at nikola tesla um but i i like to bring up anton lavoisier he was bred in the french revolution they only in, in retrospect were like oh that guy's a genius it's like how many of those guys are out there like how many copernicuses how many like pythagoras and diogenes how many <laughs> aristosthenes or algebras or i mean how many how many innovators do we know of just from history books that were treated like this, that went against the establishment, they were made martyrs and pariahs. And then it's like, if only he could have seen centuries later how people laud and or if it's like, you know, that's cold comfort to the guy who is, I mean, Galileo. I mean, come on, man, look at Galileo. I mean, that guy was tried for heresy and all that just for saying that, you know, oh, well, we rotate around the sun, the sun doesn't rotate around us. And they're like, dude, you're going to get broken on the wheel the whole nine yards. So it's like, this is nothing new. They point to the dogma in the Catholic church. Like that's a classic one scientists point to, but they seriously, like, it's just at this point, it's hypocrisy and they understand, they understand it. It's like, try to come at, come at them with the take that isn't Darwinist evolution and they will absolutely fetch and lose their minds. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's like the, the inability for any single, because when Hawking, when Hawking publishes black hole theory, this was before gravitational waves trying to like detect things like with dark matter, dark energy, the same thing like dark matter, and dark energy don't exist. They don't. It's a placeholder because we can't explain how the galaxy formed the way it did unless 90% of the galaxy was made up of a form of matter that we can't detect, see in any. And so unless the, unless the galaxy is almost twice as massive as it currently is, we can't explain how our spiral galaxy forms the way it does. We have to have this placeholder of dark matter because if it's not there, then we can't mathematically explain how things happen. And that happened similarly with, like, with the heliopause and the, and the Voyager mission. We got to the heliopause. We had all these ideas of what the edge of the sun's magnetic field looked like. It looked nothing like what we thought. It was all turbulent. It bubbled. It wasn't this like beautiful, smooth transit. It was, it's insanity. Like when rubber actually hits the road and people's theories are tested in practice, nine times out of ten, they are dead wrong. 
that's what blows me away. It's like when you actually, if they hopped into a time machine and went back, it would, it would be insane. It would be insane just how, how quickly they would prove the mo- their own selves wrong. Yeah, psychology and museum. Psychology is a pseudoscience anyway, bro. Psychology is a pseudoscience. Yeah, Galileo is an example. But there's a ton. I mean, I could probably look up more, but it's like that's kind of where we're at. And I think I'm just going to switch to like the screen view because normally I like to put up like a stream. I might uh, I might go put up um, my, my live stream because I, I love having the aquarium live stream african cam i kind of want to go back go back to the national aquarium oh but the one thing i i do kind of miss because now that i'm i'm done with college and everything probably not going back whatsoever to academia one thing i do miss is being able to at least find some people that agree because it's like you have your mainstream big time scientists, but then you have those professors and those researchers that are actually relatively sane. I'm going to move my thing down a little bit, but it's like, you actually have some people who are sane. You have people who are logical and who actually have opinions that are novel and don't just blindly believe the, the status quo, every paper that comes out. But one thing I also do notice too, is that the actual place of academia for a place of discussion is also slowly dying. You're, it's more and more getting to the point where If you talk out against these people, it's like, it's not even just like, oh, you'll be a social outcast. I'm like, they will literally pull strings and find ways to get rid of you. They, they will refuse you tenure. They will try to find an excuse to fire you. They will claim that you're like a sexual harasser or whatever. They'll, they'll find any way. This is how underhanded it's become. This is how cutthroat and political it's become is that they will find any way to get rid of you. If they have a problem professor that won't march to the beat of their drum, they'll do anything in their power to get rid of the guy. Seriously. It, it is it is honestly just an animal house in modern American universities, especially you say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, especially as a man. And you're gone like you're done. Like they will they will find a way to get rid of you. Um, let me see. I, I want to check out the National Aquarium, but that's that's kind of where we're at in academia. It's it's gotten. Uh, yeah, it's uh, I remember when the whole Google AI thing or every time they make an AI, they're like they had the Omega AI and it turned into a racist. And then they had like the Google AI and it, you know, it was like the gorilla search term. Like you look up gorilla and it would have like an African because of the facial recognition. It's like, it's stuff like that where it's like, you know, this is an AI, you need to train it. And so instead of just training the AI, they get all triggered. They're like, Oh, well, it's like, well, the AI feeds solely off of input. And if you give it the right input, then it will train based on an input. It's like, it's, it's the most programmable thing ever. It's way more programmable than an individual, but you've already seen how people will lobotomize their AI. Like Google lobotomized their AI, um, open AI lobotomized their AI. Like every single corporation from Samsung to, to Apple that creates an AI ends up lobotomizing it because they, they get so uncomfortable with the political implications of, of what they're receiving. They're, they're afraid of like what it's going to do. Their shareholders like, look at YouTube, dude. Like on this platform, I, I can't even cuss in the first 15 seconds of this video or else I'm getting immediately flagged. And I, I can't, you know, I have, I have to march the line or else it's because what a bunch of scammers with their robot voice ads won't be able to sell me like, oh, I, I stopped eating eggs and my poop started being this much better. One easy tip. It's like, that's, it's, it doesn't matter what these people are selling. Like you could have the established title scam be ubiquitous you have guys like the caspian like guys who are really cool like caspian report and stuff doing established titles and it's like an obvious scam and it's just because they have money they're ubiquitous because they have money it's like it's like if raid shadow legends wasn't even a video game and people still sponsor them like you're not going to play it but it's like they have the money to throw around yeah yeah and, and again academia is a pile of corruption there, there's no there's no more corrupt institution in our society outside of politics than academia like you could probably point to medicine you could probably point to business but it's like business there's an honesty about having to make a profit margin you know there's 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 something about that bottom line that requires a minimum of competency but an academic they can spew hot garbage that makes zero sense 
and get lauded. They could get TED Talks. They can get introduced to speak at the World Economic Forum. And they're just spewing a bunch of hot garbage. Like, we don't know what's inside of a black. We don't know how stars form. Like, think about it. It's like you ask somebody on the street and they will tell you with utter confidence. How does a black hole form? Oh, well, uh, a star is, in a, is, is always in a constant battle between uh, its expansion due to, due to heat forces and the collapsing of gravity. Uh, once the force of gravity overcomes that natural expansion, the core constricts. Uh, eventually, it gets so dense it creates a singularity, and then a supernova occurs, which expels all the surrounding gases, and those form. You, we have never seen that. We have never seen a black hole form. We've never seen a star form. We've never seen any of this stuff. There's no direct observable evidence for any of this. The only evidence we have for black holes is like this weird thermal image that a bunch of people took in deep space that's like a donut of, of light around a dark object, which doesn't even have to be a black hole. It just has to be a non-luminous object, by the way, which most people have pointed out, but they're like, oh, it's a black hole. Like it could just be a large, massive, it, it could be a massive object that's not luminous. And it's like, no, bro, it's a black hole, definitely a black hole. And like even that take, even that take is immediately shot down when it's obvious. Like the idea that the earth was formed because a Mars sized planet flew into it and the moon formed from that. I'm like, what if the moon and the earth just formed together? And that's why the orbit of the moon is so stable that they formed in conjunction in the early universe from the same constituent materials. That if we all formed from a ring, well, what's to say that like one part of the ring we didn't orbit is like, why didn't the moon just start orbiting around the earth? They could have been, that could explain why they're made from the same materials. No, 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 bro. It's definitely like a, a, a giant like planet crashed into Earth and created the moon. It's it's like all these alternative hypotheses. What you notice is it's not that they like it, it, it. They have that one thing. They have the one take. That's what you notice in modern academia. It's like you have the one take. Why did they have the one take? How is this an example of corruption? It's because if you don't have the right take, you're delegitimized. Why? Not because you're wrong, but because you don't march in line with the status quo now. This is the widely accepted belief. It's like when they talk about things like Proto-Indo-European and linguistics, and they're like, oh, well, people have all these hypotheses. It's widely believed and widely ex accepted or widely agreed upon. What does that widely mean? That widely is the official establishment take on that subject, on that matter, and it's settled. It's like when these bunch of dinguses, like what, 30 people in a room decided Pluto wasn't a planet anymore? Oh, it's a dwarf planet. We're creating, it's a dwarf planet now. Because by that definition, oh, we, oh, we have to make all these other things planets. I'm like, then why not? It's a blind leading to blind. And the saddest part is these people are often highly intelligent. These people are highly educated. But again, they're being corrupted. Like some of them aren't smart. Like, let's be clear. Just because you're in academia, just because you're educated does not mean that you're intelligent. But many of these people are intelligent. This is the worst part. People do believe them because they are eloquent and well-spoken. They do believe in what they say because they seem like they're coming from a position of truth, not a position of personal self-interest. They're making money off of what they're telling you. They're getting paid to do these speeches. They're getting paid to teach at this school. They're being paid to feed you this narrative. There's direct financial incentive for every single one of these people to keep doing what they're doing, to not rock the boat, to not speculate. They want to keep that money coming in. The subversion of this also applies to politics. I mean, you look at what happened to Jordan Peterson. Because people forget, it's like people now, it's like Jordan Peterson is such a meme. People forget that he got his start. People, he got first put on the map. What did he get put on the map for? For getting canceled, for losing his job because he dared step out of line. I mean, that's what he gets for working in the humanities department. But it's like, this guy's like, like the lectures at Harvard. Like, dude, Jordan Peterson was a top ranked psychology professor up there in academia before his fall from grace and for many people that's what made them see the light like in, at, at first most of his rants were specifically yeah pluto is a planet but it, most of his rants were specifically tied to the role 
that academics have, the role that professors have in academia, the fact that a lot of the, what he said, like a lot of the leftist far Marxist claims and everything that happens, the endemic nature of that stuff in, in the humanities departments of every single university in America and Canada and the West, that is deliberate. People who don't march along with that, they act like, oh, this is just it's it's inclusive and it's it's all the, but it's no it's being forced down people's throats professors that don't go along with this agenda the professors that don't go along with what the establishment says they should go along with are ruined not punished not fined not given a slight they are utterly utterly btfo they are completely and utterly made pariahs they are refused opportunities the people who affiliate with in the past that it's like, dude, they're utterly shunned and blocked out of the only thing, the only institution they ever strive to be a part of overnight. And, and Jordan Peterson's got a lot of people together and talk with other professors where the same thing happened. Like this one lady in his podcast, he, he had her on and she just had her own take on the Israel Palestine debate. And next thing you know, she's fired with no explanation. Next thing you know, she's, being roasted on social media, being stalked and doxxed and all this just because she had an opinion. It's like, this is, this is what it's become. It's not even, it's not even just completely about the money. It's about the power. It's about the ability to control the minds of people. So like, that's a large reason why I'm making these critiques. It's a large reason why I'm making my videos on uh, human ethology, because like, for example, in, in my, in my ethology videos, there's the reason I'm also going in on that is because, again, people want to BS you about what it's like to about male female relations. They want to BS you about the dating scene. They want to BS you about relationships. They want to BS you about marriage. They want to feed you their take of how things are instead of trying to give you an objective, clear cut explanations for how things are, how things may have got here, may have got here, and presiding from a position of maybe rather than a position of certainty. We don't know for sure. We have to put a measure of faith into any any theory, any any ideology, any anything, any construct by which we perceive the world is ultimately being filtered through an imperfect human lens. We have to place some measure of faith, some me measure of assumption into every single belief and opinion that we carry. The idea that the sun's going to rise tomorrow is not a guarantee. The sun could explode. We wouldn't have any idea. There could be a meteor heading to Earth, could be an earthquake about to happen. I, I mean, there could be a tsunami about to strike me right now. Who knows? I mean, the power might go out and the stream might end. Like now. Like, there's no guarantees in life. But there's people who will sit here and tell you how the universe started, how the universe will end, where life came from, how life got here. With absolute confidence. Because they are so delusional. They are so indoctrinated that they legitimately cannot see how utterly arrogant and full of hubris they really are to sit here and tell people that I know where we came from. I know where the earth came from. I know because we, we, I can look at these rocks and I can look at these fossils and I can look at, uh, the, the, do this math. And I know all the answers from the beginning to the end. It is arrogance that's all it is it's, it's a mixture of ego financial incentive and a system built upon a bunch of people with those egos that crush and punish anybody coming up anybody among their ranks that doesn't march the line it's it is a cult it is a science cult and people first saw this in medicine during the pandemic but they forget this applies to every single field and part of the reason i'm here explaining this stuff is is precisely because I can't just sit by and do nothing. I can't come out of academia after all the years that I'm in there and be silent about all the hypocrisy that I saw. All, all of these professors, all these published papers, and you look at it with an objective eye because you know I'm not a spring chicken anymore. And you look at it and you're like, this is obvious crap. And actually having some professors that are decent that would go through and have us critique papers and go through and be like, oh, so this doesn't work and that doesn't make sense. It's like, man, you know, this is not hard. There's nothing rocket scientific about looking at a scientific paper being like, well, that doesn't make sense. You look at the introduction like, oh, how did you get there? 
And the crazy part is they want to act like laymen. They want to act like regular people aren't able to get to that point. They want to act like regular sane human beings aren't able to actually come to these conclusions because they lack the expertise. But the very thing they're claiming is so astronomically ridiculous that even a child could point out the inconsistencies in it. It's, 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 I don't, I don't know. And here's a big thing. It's the alumni, they support the schools, support the programs, the government supports it too. So these schools already get their money. Yeah. So, and it's also begging the question. If there's, there's something, I mean, begging the question, people kind of around, like don't understand what begging the question is. It is circular reasoning. It is having a, a preconceived notion of how things are and then specifically testing to reinforce that preconceived notion. Every single person who comes in with an evolutionist slant or even a religious slant or even a, a plasma cosmologist, slant, whatever slant you have when you come in, that work that you do is inherently biased. The data you collect might be objective if the methodology is correct, but your inferences, your conclusions, the entire way you tailored your experiment is all predicated on assumptions. And this is why they're not replicable. Because if I go in and my entire test, it's like, how did flight develop? If I'm trying to figure out how flight developed in birds and my entire experiment, like, well, there's a cursorial method, there's, there's the, the arboreal method, and you only test for the methods you think of, it's like, okay, well, what if birds learn to fly from like the water? What if birds learn to fly uh, because of a hunting technique? What if birds learn to fly off of a fluke? What if birds, it's like, you know, if you think about all the ways that you can you can skin a cat, but you only think there's two ways to skin a cat, and you only test for the two ways to skin a cat. It's like which form of skinning a cat came up first? This the the front to back method or the forward to back method? And it's like, but what about all the other potential methods there may be in terms of cat skinning? It's like, if, what about what about the paws first method? What about the whiskers first method? It's like, why are you only presenting this narrative like, oh well, it's either the nose to tail method or it's the tail to nose method, and there's no other ways to skin a cat. And that's what we're being told. It's like we're being we're being given these ideas, and it, it's not actually helping us do anything. How are we becoming better as a society? How are we becoming more like how are we better at all? It's like where I live in California, we're twenty fifth place in terms of math scores. Our public schools are crap. Our academics are coming out, and they don't know anything. They're useless in the field. They're they're out of shape, so they can't do field work. They're just code monkeys, or they just are warm bodies to make up labs. They don't want you to question. They don't want you to think. They just want you to work and be technicians and not, you know, don't trust the science, bro. Trust the science. Don't question anything. Everything you're hearing, it's straight up legit. And, you, and you talk to these people, and honestly, it's so tragic. But people talk about NPCs, non-player characters. I have met more NPCs in college than I ever have anywhere else working in retail, uh, dealing is like meeting even people from me, like meeting people in the military, meeting people from other countries, like communist countries. It's like, bro, when the Chinese, when the average Chinese person is less of an NPC than the average college student, that's sad. When the, when the average Afghani questions the world more than the average kid going to a UC or a CSU or a university of whatever, an Ivy League even, that's sad. When you have people who can't even look back and realize that, oh man, this thing that people are peddling to me now, they tried to do this thing 20 years ago and I should just do my research. Doesn't happen. Yeah. So, it, yeah, and it's the assumption, it's the appeal to ethos. You have three branches in philosophy and it's the same thing, like people who just blindly follow. It's it's an appeal to ethos. You have your you have your pathos, you have your logos, and you have your ethos. And these are three bedrock uh, formations of authority. Um, well, the appeal to authority is one of ethos. So ethos is an appeal to authority. It's appeal to method. Uh, you have ethos by having by having a degree. You have ethos by having experience in your field. You have ethos because you appear in a public platform, somebody had to put you on that platform, etc. You have ethos because you're part of an organization. The issue is, is that ethos has nothing to do with logos. 
Logos is the logical modus ponens A plus B equals C aspect of what you're presenting. If you appeal from a position of logos, you're appealing from a position of at least logical truth, reason. It may not be the truth, but it's sound. And by being sound, that just means that it makes sense. It may not be the truth, but it's sound. It's, it's valid, I guess. The validity of it is not in question. Your method is correct. You might be wrong. Like I could sit here and give you a very convincing argument of, uh, of, of why we should all be, you know, eating bugs and living in pods talking about like, oh, well, insects are so protein dense and, you know, they're, they're great. You can, you know, you can have farm an entire cricket farm in your back shed. And I mean, living in a pod, do you really need to sleep in anything larger than just a bed? You know, you could share a bunk. It's great in terms of social bonding, early humans, slept in such confined quarters and do you really need a car like we you know public transport's great it's like you so they make all these arguments and so it's like yeah there, there's logos there there's logos there i could i could sit here in a lab coat and tell you all these things but then there's the pathos so there's the emotional argument oh the world's gonna end oh man it's you know fear monger city it's like you know if you don't do this if you don't take this jab if you don't sleep in this pod if you don't eat this bug you're not going to have a future. All the elephants are going to be dead. All the pandas are going to be dead. Um, all the puppies are going to be dead. It's going to be like an apocalypse for cute animals. You're like the entire coastline is going to fall into the ocean. Uh, it's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth and fire is going to rain from the sky. And that's the path. So it's like they, they take all of these arguments. They take all these facets of actual intellectual debate and they twist them. Because what it is at the end of the day is propaganda. They want you to feel a certain way. That's all propaganda is. Propaganda is a presentation of information through a medium in order to make you feel or think a certain way. That is the classical textbook definition of propaganda. And that's their goal. Their goal isn't to make you think. It's the goal is to make you feel. The goal is to make you trust and believe, not think. Yeah. And... And, and this is why, because you hear you hear a lot, like guys like Andrew Tate, and even even guys like Kevin Sammons, I know you guys come here from the manosphere, but, but, but look at this. You can't care about, people say like, oh, you shouldn't care about what women think. That's true. You shouldn't care about what men think. You shouldn't care about what society, academia, anything thinks. You don't exist as a means of production. You don't exist as a mouthpiece. You don't exist as a consumer or a producer, you exist. Like you are your own person, no matter who you are. There's other people who will try to convince you otherwise, who say that your worth is predicated solely upon these factors that I deem worthy. And those people want do not want the best for you. People who say like your worth or your existence is only valuable, only useful because of these things that I list off here. Who is that person? Why are you listening to that person? It's like, if you think critically, thinking critically is all the W's. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Why does this person want me to think this way? What benefit did they gain? And what benefit do I gain from this? From where are they coming from? What is the actual position that they're holding here? What is the end goal? If they want me to eat the bug burger, is it because it's nutritious or is it because they want to take down an industry? Is it because they're being paid to say so by somebody else? Do they even believe what they're saying? Or is this all just a part of a bigger plan or just part of a scheme to get someone else to do someone's talking for them so they can push something else? And that's what people have kind of like connected the dots with, I think, in the last few years. But they haven't been able to properly articulate exactly what's going on. And what's going on is that you are expected, not, not them, not their bosses, not their, not the people providing money. You are expected to do the hard work of believing what they say. They want you to believe what they say, not by thinking about it, not by arguing, doing internal debate. They want you on blind faith or ethos or appeals to emotion to believe everything that they say. Yeah, man. It's been great, Emmanuel. Hope you hope you do well, bro. Yeah, but the new year has brought a lot of new opportunities for us as as people to sort of like get out of that box. Because nobody's perfect. We all have things that we believe and hold on to, opinions that we have that are not based in reality. They're straight up cope. They're attempts to rationalize the world. They're moralistically or ethically dubious. 
But the difference is, is that we're not trying to push that down other people's throats 99% of the time. You know, it's okay to have a wrong opinion. It's okay to have a wrong way of looking at things, but who decides what's wrong or right? You know, for many people, they derive that authority from a higher power. They place their ethos and even their pathos in things that are non-tangential. But what we see today is that they want you in order of putting your faith into a deity, in order to put a faith into your own logical way of looking at things, in order to put your faith into uh, just a rational and reasonable approach, a sensible way of looking at the world, they just want you to blindly trust what they say because they said all of these things that sounded pretty intelligent, that sounded pretty consistent, coherent at face value. And so just believe them. Don't do your own research. You know, if you do your own research, only look at sources that we approve and don't actually question what we're saying in any capacity. As a matter of fact, what I'm doing right now is not rocket science. Like I said before, I can find all this information very readily. In fact, most of the time, the information I present in these critiques in all of my videos is right there on the clear web, right there. It's like, I'm going to UC Berkeley. I'm going to Psychopedia Britannica. I'm going to Cornell. I'm going to Oxford. I'm going to like university websites to find this information. And what am I finding? All I'm doing is picking through the things that they claim and showing exactly why they're saying these things, not because it's based in truth, because it's based in money, because it's based in politics and agendas. And that's why they're doing it. This, this whole thing about like, oh, we found, oh, this black hole imaging couldn't possibly be an exoplanet, couldn't possibly be a rogue planet, couldn't possibly be a non-luminous brown or, or black dwarf, couldn't be an exhausted star, couldn't just be something less luminous than the thermal imaging that we have around it. It can't even be a contrastive effect between a star and other constituents. Nope, we know that this, this image that we compiled by taking multiple pictures from around the earth it's all to boost funding. They, they published this. I remember when it came out when I was living in Germany. It, they wanted more funding. They wanted more money. They wanted the acclaim. They wanted their faces in newspapers. And there's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong is to hoodwink people, to, to come out and just make inferences and wild claims without having the proper justification, without having the proper confidence behind your data to actually claim these things. So you want to come out and make these definitive grandiose statements like the moon came from a Mars-sized planetoid crashing into the Earth instead of the more rational conclusion that they just formed together. It's okay to hold one over the other. It's okay to believe that the Earth came from a collision or that the moon came from a collision. It's okay to believe that the moon formed alongside Earth. Both of these assumptions hold equal weight. But if you ask an academic, they'll say, oh, because of this and this and this, this is more likely. Is it though? Because you have to ask yourself, what is it about those factors in your mind that makes this more likely? Is it more likely because of these factors? Or are you retroactively applying reasons why things might work to a theory that at first was completely unsubstantiated? Again, begging the question. You're starting with an assumption and then working backwards to justify it. When you say the burden of proof is on you to prove something, that's because you should have gotten there from an objective place. It should be easy for you to provide that burden of proof because the way you got there is objective. But if you have an agenda to begin with, eventually you circle back. It's circular reasoning for a reason. You just circle back to the beginning. Like, how did you get there? It's like, oh, well, you know, the earth is crashing in this. So we look for this, this, and this factors to back it up. But it's like, Okay, so when you look for this, this, and this factors, what can those factors imply something else entirely then? Why do these factors have to imply that the Earth was hit by a planetoid? Why can't these factors imply that the Earth and the Moon form together? You have to actually, the burden of proof is on you to prove that this data implies this. But because they apply their logic backwards, they make their claims and their hypotheses first, if, then, you know, etc. The if, then statement comes out, but you test your hypothesis. That isn't backwards. It's inductive and deductive reason. It's scientific method. The inference comes first. That's the problem. The inference comes first. They say, oh, the earth formed this way. It's like if the for earth formed, like if the moon formed from a cosmic impact, then we'd see these factors. You could easily have your hypothesis be the other way around. 
because there's no way of saying this is how this works. Your hypothesis has to not be begging the question. But this is an example of how clear logical fallacies slip their way into science all the time, especially in, in science that isn't that that based in, in the modern day. If you look at paleontology and archaeology and anthropology, especially, for some reason, anthropology is really mired by this. You see that all the time. People begging the question, making massive assumptions before they've even done their experimentation. It's like, oh, I know what I'm going to find. It's like, really, man? Like, that's how you're going to treat the deep past? You just, you know that this Displetosaurus you found is in between the Tyrannosaurus Rex and early Displetosaurus, and you're just confident that that's like, oh, it's a transitional specimen. Couldn't be individual variation, couldn't be a regiomorph, couldn't be any ex anything else. It couldn't be anything else but what I say, because I have all the answers. Yeah. And and that's that's crazy. It's like when people can have more because like again like the whole professor dave thing blew my mind the fact this dude sits here and he talks about how he's like a professor and has a master's and all this stuff and yet just resorts to ad hominem to attack it's like bro i've he, i've seen more sane discussions about like who would win like goku or like uh, who, goku or superman like I, i've seen better debates about like which anime is better than what i've seen from from academics in terms of what they disagree it's like literally plasma cosmology versus the big bang both of these things absolute complete malarkey and yet this dude gets super caught up about plasma cosmology i'm like there's as much proof for plasma cosmology as there's for the big bang and vice versa it's just like my my existentialist humanist secular cope is is better than your humanistic secular cope and it's just to me that's funny but yeah <laughs> Yeah, one punch, man. Yeah, the burden of proof is on you. It's like, I, I know he's one punched everybody, but there's no guarantee the next time he one punches, it's gonna it's gonna win. Besides, could, would he even be able to one punch Goku with instantaneous transmission? I don't think so. Goku does this, and suddenly he's like, "Omae wa mo shinderu" to Saitama. So, can Saitama tank Kamehameha? We'll see. We'll see. I, I don't even know if he can touch Goku with that Ultra Instinct, bro. But yeah, and it's these two things, mostly for money. And if you don't follow the rules, you're a bigot. And if you don't believe me, you can look at Jordan Peterson. Uh, you can look at all these other professors that were canceled. If you don't believe me, you can look at the paychecks that many of these speakers, like look at you know, how much money uh, Bill Nye the Science Guy makes or Neil deGrasse Tyson. See who pays them. See who's paid Hawkins. See, see who's paid uh, Carl Sagan. See who's paid any of these people that have told people with confidence where the world comes from, told people with confidence that their previous belief systems are full of crap um, that they're going to lead people away from the opiate of the masses. And it's just like, how are you not a cult leader? It's like, I feel like I've heard all these same arguments from the uh, latter day saints. I feel like I've heard all these same arguments from like the Ant Hill kids and, and like heaven's gate. Like how are you any different than any other cultist telling somebody that your preconceived notions are all wrong and I have all the answers. How are you any different? You say that you have evidence and proof, but the same evidence and proof that you use to support your theories can easily be used, as I pointed out in all of my videos and all of my streams thus far, can be easily be used against you. Again, none of my none of my claims are coming from any other realm of science but zoology. It is straight up Darwinistic evolution. I'm just pointing out that the mechanisms for evolution are incompatible with your theories. If you have your mutations, if you have New allele growth plus natural and sexual selection being the predicative mechanism upon which you see radical transitional species change, then you should be able to use modern animals as an example and as an analog to explain things we see in the fossil record, but you can't. But you can't. It's just that's just not how life works. And yet we want to assume that past animals can metamorph into new creatures in 10 to 15 million years and radically change their niches, radically change their physiology, radically change their genotype. Modern animals don't do that. 10 million years ago, we almost see all the same uh, species that we see in the Miocene that we do today. See, We see giraffes and we see horses and we see camels and we see like a lot of extinct stuff. But what we see is Pleistocene American and Pleistocene. So like people are like, where's all the Pleistocene fauna? It's like Africa. It's a perfect example of like, oh, well, humans extincted all the megafauna. It wasn't massive natural conversion due to a shifting climate. 
Climate change is purely anthropomorphic. That was due to human hunting. Small bands of spear-throwing hunter-gatherers killing off all the mammoth and woolly rhino. I, I know they didn't do that in Africa, the, the place where all the humans supposedly came from, and where, which had the highest human population for almost all of prehistory until the advent of agriculture. I, I didn't see any of the uh, woolly mammoths were extincted by, by small bands of hunter-gatherer Clovis people, but elephants weren't killed off by Africans. Woolly rhinos were supposedly killed off by small bands of Stone Age spear chuckers, but they, that didn't happen in Africa. Giraffes go extinct. Horses go extinct in North America. Humans to blame. Didn't go extinct in Eurasia where humans were too. So it's like, think about it. It's like, this isn't rocket science. This is, this is not me. I didn't even have to pull up an article for that. I just take what they say and I just flip it around. Like, why is it that, why is your conclusion, why is your conclusion the only clue, conclusion we can come from with these facts? Why can I not clearly point to another example where your theory breaks down and then it's just the cope comes out? And it's like, all you hear is this straight copium. Yeah, we hunted Neanderthals to extinction so hard that they make up two to three percent of our genome, you know? It's like, we don't know what happened. I'm, I'm sure a few Neanderthals got hit with some rocks hit with some clubs and then the other argument is are neanderthals even a different species no according to the biological species concept we can reproduce it with them and produce fertile offspring that's not a different species human a bantu african and a scandinavian or chinese can have a fixation index genetic distance further apart than upland and lowland gorillas or different subspecies of giraffe or coyotes and North American gray wolves, but are they different subspecies? No, one race, human race, guys. That's how this works. There is, there's nothing that has to be objective about science, because if you do make science objective, people can't take it anymore. They don't want to come to terms with what the science says because they have an inherent agenda they're trying to promote. And it's not a left-right thing. It's where's the money? Who's going to pay me to say this? Who's going to not pay me to say this? Who's going to try to ruin my career if I do say it, it's like at the heart of everything, at the heart of academia, yeah, there's politics. Yeah, there's a lot, there's been large scale subversion of our university systems by, by Marxists and communists ever since the start of the Cold War, ever, ever since the Frankfurt School relocated to, to the Ivy Leagues. This has been a thing. And people want to say, oh, it's conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy theorist. When you have most political philosophy professors being open spoken Marxists and you have open marxist demonstrations in major american cities that are mostly made up of college students you understand very quickly that academia is not a place where you learn objectively okay this is how things work no you're getting directly brainwashed and programmed into thinking a certain kind of way if you're even remotely conservative on a college campus you're a pariah if you think outside the box if you question the status quo in any department you're seen as being stubborn and obstinate and not willing to learn the material. Guess what? I got an A in evolution. I had to take evolution, got an A. In. It was one of the last classes I ever took. It was just all, and you know, it, it, that doesn't mean anything. You can jump through hoops. It doesn't mean that what you're learning is valuable. But yeah. And that's a great, and I point to dogs all the time. I even mentioned that recently on a video about dogs. If you dug up a Chihuahua and you dug up a Great Dane 60 million years from now, you would probably place them in different genera. You'd probably place them in completely different, you might even place them in different orders. They, they will literally find like, oh, well, the tooth is kind of different in this dinosaur. It's like based on tooth morphology, we might, we might place dogs in the same genus. But look at look at canids. Uh, look look up uh, look at the dire wolf. It's not in canis. It's an anocyon. The dole. You look at the dole. If you look up a dole, that's not that's not in canis either. A dole is in the genus Kuan, the African wild dog, or the painted wolf, however they want to call it now. Again, that's a psyop. They want to change its name because it's not. Uh, uh, charismatic enough that's in the genus Lycaon all of them are dogs right like you can you can take a take a wolf and turn it into a great dane or chihuahua and yet we need different gen genera for all these different types of canid all these different types of canid get their own genera 
because we say so, because we make the rules. You, you can you can have a, a you can have a Great Pyrenees, and you can have a Pomeranian, but all of these different canids are in different genera. That's what's funny to me. It's like understand that a lot of the systems that they approach you with are made by them too. You know, you're playing their game, and this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to play their game and show them because you could easily just not play their game and be like, well, systematic. I mean, taxonomy is just an artificial system. It's artificial. It doesn't actually exist in nature. There's nothing inherently natural about mathematics, nothing inherently natural about taxonomy. And I just don't observe it. And I know people like that. It's like, I just don't think taxonomy is actually based in nature. It's just a human method of understanding the world. Their entire concept of what a species is, is completely irrelevant uh, to what the natural world is on about. And evolution, the entire framework of evolution is presumptuous because it assumes that there's something bedrock fundamental about our concept of what a species is. There's that take. And it's a valid take too. I know a lot of people, especially uh, religious people who have that view. They're just like, well, I'm just not going to play the game. I just don't believe in their systems of taxonomy and phylogeny in the first place. But <laughs> before it was the normie chip, now evolved to a sophisticated... I had... I don't, I realize, so I go through my PC, I go through my phone, right? And just a quick aside, I think, I, cause I'm getting to the 250 mark. I think I've said what I wanted to say. So I, I, so it's a new year, new me, right? Like I grew the facial hair and I, I'm like, I'm trying to go on to bigger and better things. But one thing I noticed though, I'm like, look, my channel, like I, I, I changed, I changed from bust and nut to bust them on nuts, right? But I'm like, look, I haven't truly gone through my full character arc. I haven't gone through my full transformation. And then I was like up late night and I posted, I like have everything in all my pictures tagged in my phone. Like you can put a little description and I typed in monkey. Like I have a little bracket and then I put in monkey for the tag. And that was one of them that came up. I'm like, look, I have like cringe virgin blue pilled monkey profile pic. And then I have this like super chat tier CEO of base department uh, chimp over here. And I just was like, it was just a natural switch. Like, who knows? I might even get like an AI generated image. I want to start playing around with that more. Get like AI generated scenes of like the prehistoric world. Because I know right now people are just making like AI generated like battleships and like cat girl girlfriends and stuff. But I was thinking of like, what if I can get like an AI generated chimp using that, that as a prompt and then truly have my own art. That's like AI art. Yeah. Cultured chimp. And I'm trying to be more cultured. One of the biggest things I'm trying to, I'm trying to kind of push here with the new year and something I, I haven't really explained to people either is uh, like me and me and Edwin have kind of like gone to our own channels now. Like we're not, I don't, I don't know if we're ever going to really do a chop up again, to be honest. I know that might sound not really sad or anything, but like, what we kind of, what I'm kind of trying to do now is to be more sophisticated and kind of be more serious in that respect, but also kind of like be more realistic. Because the two things I really want to cover with my channel is, yeah, and the, there's the there's the copyright thing. And so if I use an AI generated image, they can't copyright me. But I'll see. I I, I don't know, like, because YouTube is just crazy. Like YouTube's entire mon monetization thing, it seems like they just want to lay people off, like they can't afford. To pay people but that's that's ridiculous because all their money always came from advertisers anyway so for my take i think the main thing is is if i sanitize myself i'll make myself seem more like a like as i want to i still want to be tongue-in-cheek like i don't want to just be this sterile cut and dry educate because i there's something unhinged to to the, the critic like you have to be a critic and be a little bit unhinged no one likes a straight laced typical normie critic like those people are uninteresting and quite frankly they're just not effective it's like you can't be an npc normie like you can't have zero autism and be able to be a good critic you have to be able to see through the propaganda it, the more immune to propaganda you are the better of a critic you ultimately are so you have to have that that the little that little edge of uh you know just taking the edge off so when people when people see me like they comment it's so funny because one of the biggest ways i I generate the thoughts and opinions that I have, for example, is I comment. Like I actively get into flame wars in the comments. I mentioned Professor Dave, like that's how it all started. Like I, I got, you know, I started a flame war in his comment section. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I started it. I started it by saying like, you know, it's funny. You can predict the, 
beginning of the universe, but you can't predict the weather two weeks in advance. And suddenly I'm in the comments with people being like, oh, well, you know, meteorology and physics, it's not the same thing. I'm like, well, it's all based on math, isn't it? It's all based on physics, isn't it? And they're like, rrr, rrr, rrr. and it's just hilarious. I just find it hilarious. It's, it's, it's just trolling with logic and facts and people can't take it. They can't take someone who understands the subject just as well as them who can go and Google this stuff in two seconds and present a coherent argument for why they're an idiot. It, it makes their entire, it's their, their entire superiority complex crumbles. And I get off on that. You know, there's, there's something, there's something great about watching someone's ego get completely deflated because they spent all this time just being blindly believed by people. But then suddenly the truth just comes to light like a bolt of lightning. So, Oh yeah, he's got his own YouTube channel. It's called uh, Monsanto TV. So I can, I think he has a new one, but I'll, I'll just type it in the chat. Yeah, I don't know, but we kind of, we kind of just came to the consensus that uh, that you know we're just we're just kind of kind of do our own thing, but at the same time too, I I think he's got been going through a lot. And he's trying to get his wife over from Colombia and stuff. And I, I think we're just doing different stuff. But yeah, and I, I feel this in, in my bones, DZ. Like the thing is, is I just find it funny because when people take themselves so seriously and you, you know, those types, it's like those kids, you know, you would definitely have bullied in, in like grade school. Just those like push the glasses up, like kind of kids. And we're, we've all been there, but I just find it funny because again, you can't care about what other people think. It sounds like there's this, there's this weird pathological altruism that exists in Western civilization where we're super individualistic, but at the same time, we place so much weight on the words and opinions of other people who don't care about you, who don't have your best interest at heart, or even if they do have your best interest at heart. What they really are trying to do is please themselves. They're trying to get you to conform to what they want out of the world and not actually what you want for yourself. And yeah, sometimes like, you know, you got, you should be accountable for your actions. You should try to better yourself, try to be the best person you can be. But most people you're going to meet in life don't want that from you. They don't. It's, it's, a, it's a sad realization, but this is why you can't care about what people think. And that's why like trolling in comment sections, I, it's such a, it's so fun to me because people take themselves so seriously, especially in YouTube comments, like, especially knowing what I know, it's people who will come out and it's like, they're just regurgitating information. And there's, and they're the easiest people. It's like, if I can even, if I, a lot of times I'll start in these comments, it's like, if I, if I can even drop like three red pills, that'll change their way of thinking and help them actually, you know, effectively approach the world from then on and not just blindly trust people, then maybe, maybe I can, maybe I can make a difference. Maybe I can help these guys out. And help them not be such NPCs anymore. Because it's like, once you exit out of the Matrix, like, you know, even Neo was Mr. Anderson at some point. You know, that guy had to, he had to get unplugged. You know, he's the chosen one. He was an NPC just like the rest of them. He, he was inside the Matrix and didn't know. So it's not that like, oh, they're NPCs, they're untaminch, they're irredeemable. It's like, you gotta, if it takes trolling, then so be it. And if the people have a visceral reaction, then they're like, oh no. But they're going to walk away. It's like, you know, you can't walk away from an argument where you lose and not be like, okay, I need to change some of my opinions and stuff. Like even the most ardent, you know, internet trawlers know this, but, oh yeah. Oh no. So they're, they're from El Salvador, but his dad, his dad actually can't go back because he left, uh, he's on an asylum visa. So if he does decide to go back, he's not able to come back to America. Basically like he didn't, he never filed for citizenship. So his his dad won't be doing that unless he really just wants to make the move. Edwin might do it, but again, like I said, I don't like. I think he's in the process of bringing his wife over, so I don't think he's going to try and make that move. Maybe he'll try to do it in El Salvador, but yeah, I don't know. And it's there's and there's no bad. It's it's honestly I'm pretty confused by it, but yeah, it's it's just yeah, it's it's a it's a muddy situation right now, but. Yeah, the truth hurts. The truth does hurt. And I I will bring this up for just a just a brief moment. But like the truth, the truth is an intangible. Yeah, it's it's an intangible. Like there's the Newman, like Immanuel Kant 
brought up the concept of a noumenon, the absolute truth, and the phenomenon, which is a presentation of the truth through our own perspective. And basically what it is, is that the truth ultimately is always going to be filtered through a human medium. And however the human medium mutates or, or alters or perverts or twists or manipulates that truth, that noumenon, is what the phenomenon is perceived as. It's all like, oh, if a tree fell in the forest, would it ever make a sound? Uh, you know, that's, that's how it is. The answer to that is, yes, it does. Sound waves are produced. The actual vibrate, the falling of the tree produce the sound waves that propagate through the medium of the atmosphere. Those are sound waves. Those exist. Did it make a sound? What is a sound? A sound is a loud noise. It is a, it's not even a loud noise. A sound is something perceptible to the ear. So like, well, it's not perceptible to the ear. Okay, but it still had all of the physical components to make a sound. What is a sound in terms of its noumenon? If it's purely the physical aspects of the, of the movement of the air, then a sound is a fundamental physical concept. If it's the perception by the ear, then you perceive a sound to be something specific to the human. It's a phenomenon. There's no noumenological element to, to a sound. The sound only exists because of humanity. And that take is blue-pilled. There is a noumenon to everything. And this is where like the, the Stoicists and a lot of like philosophers have a lot of trouble because they can't piece that apart. Like, What is the absolute truth to something? What's the ideal form, as Plato would say? But the truth of the matter is, is that existence is existence. Reality is reality. And we simply make labels and create terms and formate boxes within which we place these items. We, we categorize and pattern everything. And that's basically what happens when we take truth and we make it digestible to humans. We cut it up and we compartmentalize it and it works out. You know, bro, I honestly, like, if he was here, I'd speak more about it. But dude, honestly, like, so much, it's, it, like, that dude's love life is a mess. Like, I'm not even gonna lie, bro. Like, part of the reason that I kind of have the way, like, I, I believe that everyone is entitled to live their own life. Like, I still want to have kids. I still want to have a family. But I know for a fact that at this point in my life, like, in my 30s, my main goal is to do that. I'm not 30 yet, but at this point, like I'm gaming towards that. And I think that the idea of getting married and having kids in modern America just isn't smart. I, I highly feel like I should just go to like Romania. I should pull like an Andrew Tate and go to like the Ukraine after the war is over and it's like devastated. Like I say Ukraine wins. I'm like, dude, what's stopping me from going to the Ukraine? And like, oh, these poor, devastated, you know, horror, like impossible to rebuild. And I, I come there with like, you come there with like a thousand dollars and you, you, you're you balling. You're like Dennis Rodman with like two and a half thousand dollars in war-torn post-war Ukraine. I'm like, you're telling me I can get like a nine out of 10 village girl who's like, whose biggest concern is like getting clean drinking water. It's like, I wouldn't show up and could leverage that 10 times more than a girl who expects me to have a six figure income. And like, be, it's, it's just like trying to, it's not even like, and this is why I make my other videos. It's like, dude, very true. Very true. It's like, dude, in, in the modern times, you like girl, I, I've literally been on dates with girls and it's like, you feel judged. You feel judged. Like I sit here and I have all these things going for me. And you still feel inadequate because you're expected to have all, you're supposed to check all these boxes. It's like, these are girls who want you to have a, for, a, a nice car and your own house, like with a mortgage. And they want you to have like a six figure income and they want you to be child free and debt free and be in perfect shape. And they, and they come at you with tattoos and they come at you in, late 20s early 30s they they have a phd they have 16 dudes that they've been with if not more 
they have, you know, exes in their past that they talk about like, bro, I, I recently went on a date with a girl who I still like, who I still might hit up. And she spent like half the day talking about how she just broke up with her ex-boyfriend. It's like, these are the type of people that I'm supposed to like, it's like, I'm supposed to impress you. Like, like I'm supposed to bring all this to the table and all you're bringing is baggage and, and, and used equipment. Like, I think that's why so many people in the manosphere came up. Cause for me, it's very logical. It's just, it's just mate selection. Like that's why I do videos on mate selection as it pertains to humans. Cause for me, it's very cut and dry. Like uh, there was a lot of emotion involved and that's honestly like, I guess where my kryptonite comes in, but, but yeah, it's, it's true. It's too risky nowadays. Uh, but I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm, I don't think there's anything wrong with choosing how you live your own life. It's just that there's consequences to that. And I think people have to be realistic about what their standards are if they come to that point. Like if you're in academia and you're somebody like a Jordan Peterson, if you're in the manosphere and you are a guy like Andrew Tate, if you're in any profession where you decide to rock the boat or come out with a controversial take, you're going to have to pay for it socially. There's a social debt that you have to incur by going against the grain. That's why people don't do it. They're not brave enough. They don't want to uh, incur the wrath of their peers. They don't want to be rejected by their in-group. But the issue is, is that that breaks down really quick when the ins <laughs> the backlash you get it's like yeah conform to society by living up to the standards of a modern woman and what she wants from you she expects you to be what is it i think it's joker that says the sixes like the rule of six like six feet tall six figure income six pack abs six inches downstairs like stuff like that and it's like you can't be going bald you can't um you can't even remotely have any financial instability you have to be gainfully employed um you have to be well hung you have to know what to do with a woman in bed you have to both have a bunch of experience with women but not so much experience that you're like you know uh, uh, an f boy or whatever it's it's impossible it's like it this is why i say you can't care because eventually it's like i it's like okay you you hear this and then i i know people who have families and stuff and they're not prime specimens. They're oftentimes absolute pieces of crap. And then you see what the people that these women actually go after. And it's like, look, don't play the game. You know, don't play their game. Like don't live up. It's like, don't be the beta male simp groveling for, for the attention of women that aren't worth anything. That's all. It's like, that's all I tell guys. You don't have, and that's the greatest part about being a man. I don't have to marry these women. I don't, have, I don't have to live up to their expectations. I don't have to, I don't have, I don't even have to, I don't have to meet up with them. I don't, I don't have to message them. It's like every time I see a video um, involving these people, I think that's why, why Drex talks so much about these like German shepherds and stuff is, is that, you know, Drex, Drex has experience in this world. You know, Drex, ha Drex has experience dealing with people from radically different places. That's the same thing with uh, Andrew Tate. It's the same thing with Joker. It's like Kevin Samuels, especially these are older guys with experience the experience. Yeah. And it's the satanic man. What is Satan? So think about it. Think about this statement, the satanic man the, they call it the dark triad, but the idea is like what attracts it. It's the charismatic psychopathic dude who doesn't care. He's confident. He's self-assured, but why is he self-assured? Why is he confident? It's that's what matters. Some guys, they're, they're confident because of their wealth. Guess where that gets you? You're like, oh, well, I check off these boxes. Next thing you know, she doesn't want you. Oh, yeah. Satanic man. But it's true. Think about the kind of guy you get who has all these boxes checked. Think about the ego you get. Think about the entitlement you get. It's like you want somebody who checks these boxes, but you also want a saint. You want a guy who's emotional and feeling and caring. You want you want this guy not only to have all these traits, but to also care about you in the same way. But this guy is a literal giga chat. This guy's like Leonardo DiCaprio. 
now with his new 23 year old girlfriend and stuff it's like a guy who's actually balling that hard is not going to look twice at a girl in her late 20s or early 30s with tattoos sometimes with kid already or kid on the way multiple ex-boyfriends that she still can't shut up about that's what modern dating is you're not today it's it's this this that's a fair claim if this was 1950 and this girl was you know we were living in a dating game where there's much less promiscuity much less drug use it's like girls who smoke and girls who take Molly, like I was in a, like, I've, I've, I could tell you nightmares. Girls who are mentally ill and need therapy. Girls who are mi- diagnosed mentally ill on multiple drugs with obvious tattoos and dyed hair and are like the whole nine yards. Bodies whooped, faces whooped, you know, going nowhere, absolutely nothing to provide but pure sexual satisfaction. And they think they deserve the world. And fair point. There are other Giga Chats out there. In that too, but here's the thing: when you're the one percent, the Giga Chad, what is the Giga Chad gonna do? You find the Giga Chad, but the Giga Chad is going to move through, he's gonna mow through his contact list because he's a savage. He's not gonna set, he knows the game. Because guess what? That happens to the Giga Chads too. You think the moment the butterflies are gone, it's like this guy, again, I've seen this a lot. How many times do you see the guy who was like football quarterback in high school, like to, like total, like I know guys who are in the military, like I know a guy in the military, bro. Guy in the military, like high school, like top tier athlete, baseball player, joined the military. He was even like, you know, even did like paratrooper stuff, really well put together, really attractive guy. And didn't stop his wife from leaving him. He was 35 years old, you know, didn't, didn't stop, you know, being attractive, being in shape, having a solid career and job didn't stop her from cheating and sleeping around. Doesn't mean anything, man. It's all about who you pick, who, who you decide to get married to is the most important decision. Ever made. Yeah. And look at, what is it? Um, Giselle, what is her name? In? Like Tom Brady's wife. I, I want to. I was gonna say Gisley Maxwell. It's like I, I showed it on the other on the other stream. Uh, it was that horrible picture of Tom Brady and Giselle Bunchen. Like, look at look at this ridiculousness. So it's like, look at this dude and and his wife. Let me let me share this screen real quick. Cuz this is this is honestly just Oh, wait, I, I forgot to have it like this. So it's like you you see this, right? You see this. So this is literally Tom Brady. So Tom Brady, if you assumed like if this, if this is just like a regular guy, right? Regular guy. Not even like imagine he's a plumber. Imagine he's a plumber. You would still think this is a rather handsome couple. She's not too bad, but, you know, it seems like a normal, regular, healthy couple. But then you factor in the fact that this guy is a multi-millionaire. This guy has multiple rings. This guy, all these people taking pictures are there for him. Not for her. For him. This guy back here, the paparazzi... He's not there for, for for this girl. It's a joke out there. Look at this. Every single person in this picture is taking a picture because of Tom Brady. But guess who gets fleeced in court? Guess, guess who got paper served, man? It's like this, this is part of Hollywood. This is like part of Hollywood culture. This idea, and it's like, let's let's even look at So it's like, okay, we have Yahoo, we have CNN. But I want to see, it's 13 years, 13 years. And it says, 13 years of marriage, they're announcing a divorce. She's a 42-year-old, he's 45. 
Think about it, bros. Think about it for two milliseconds. You don't know what the future is going to bring. And there's no more important decision you will ever make than who you decide to marry, who you decide to, to, to tie the knot with. There's no more important decision you will, you will ever make. And guess what? Ho Hollywood culture, it's now normal because of what? Because of the media, because of all of these impotent, all of these people in education, all these people in TV shows where it's like butterflies are gone. Who cares? I'm gone. And, but it's like, it's not just that anymore. It's also the fact the courts openly and explicitly are many times. And there are exceptions to this because you have, you have to be smart. Like courts can screw over anybody, but it is the laws and the lawyers and the judges that make this situation what it is in the West. You want to know why it's horrendous why you bring your wife over she becomes a feminist that's because of the television that's because of societal pressure but if you want to know why she takes you to court you want to know why she serves you papers that's why because she knows if she shows up to a court she's going to get majority custody of the kids she's going to get half your stuff she's probably going to get alimony especially if she makes like half what you make if you if you're not on the same earning potential even if you are you're on the hook for child support. You're on the hook for alimony. You're losing half of the assets you've gained since you signed that marriage contract. Social media. The assumption that marriage because of love. Marriage because of love. It's, it, it's like this is a society with legal adultery. Legalized adultery. If you commit adultery, that does it doesn't matter if she cheats on you. It doesn't. That won't affect custody. That won't affect anything. Oh, she cheated? Who cares? Legal adultery. No fault divorce. I Meaning there's no penalty for filing, no, no penalty for actually engaging in it. It's, it's seen as fair and balanced. For whatever reason, there is filing unless there is a crime committed, such as domestic abuse, unless there's, and even in times where there is drug abuse, it's like there is such an obvious bias, especially if kids are involved. And think about it. This happened not in their 30s. Not in their 30s, in their 40s, in their mid 40s. Mid 40s after 13 years of marriage. That means that Tom Brady got married at 32 years old, a very sensible age to get married. It's the age that I'm kind of gunning for, you know, like your early 30s. Gets married to a beautiful wife, very successful career. Still gets fleece, bros. Still gets fleece because he got with a, a girl who was notorious for trying to find herself a man, courting all these rich males in Hollywood, playing her game. And like you said, David, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Tom Brady's biggest mistake was not marrying, you know, marrying period. It wasn't not having kids. The mistake Tom Brady made was picking somebody who was only with him for his money. It's like these guys who want a wallet max. These guys like, okay, so let's take Andrew Tate, who's, who talks about like his physique and masculinity. It's honestly the element of truth that Andrew Tate has. And I don't like Andrew Tate. I'm just letting you know this now because I, I fundamentally disagree with his definition of masculinity, but he's right because ultimately physicality is basically most of what you need with a large element of confidence, a large element of self-assurance. It's the dark triad personality type personified. A guy in, as arrogant as Andrew Tate, how does he work out? Oh, by softening up a little bit uh, or by, you know, by, by giving this old switcheroo, he is like, oh, well, I can change him. It's like, if a guy is attractive enough, if you lead with your wallet, if you lead with your looks, that's all it's going to be about. People don't want to be with you for you. And again, that's also a fair point. There's no unconditional love because you have to be smart about how you approach your relationships. You have to maintain them deliberately. You have to maintain the love in the relationship. Ghislaine, or I keep saying Ghislaine, it's, it's Giselle. I keep thinking of like Ghislaine Mas Maskwell for some reason, but Giselle uh, Bunsen. So she's divorcing. 
there's this assumption that the divorce is because of his dis, but it's like amicably finalized our divorce. Amicably finalized our divorce, guys. Let, let me let me let me let me throw this up for you. Amicably, right there it says amicably finalized. Our children we love with all our heart. So she did this, regardless of what it's going to do to the kids, regardless of how it affects the kids, regardless of how the visibility affects her family. It's, 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 it's selfishness on a level that I can't even explain. It, it is, it, it is the personification of the selfishness of, of who these people are. Because again, it's like, you can't just say, you know, it's, it's easy to say like all women are like this. All humans are like this. This is him making a poor decision in terms of who he decides to actually marry. He married leading with his wallet, leading with his status. He didn't lose his money or status. It's just that, bro, if you get with somebody and you make 10 million more dollars and they leave you, they're getting five of those million dollars. She, she, she just conned him. She played the long game. She conned the guy. That's all there is to it. And there, you can't even hate it. You can't even be mad because this is the system. He deliberately entered the system predicated solely off that. And I'm actually going to look up for false law. I'm, I'm going to stop the screen first, but I want to, but so here we go. I'm going to, I'm going to share this. I'm, I'm glad that, wait a minute. Well, okay, so here it is. I didn't realize I added this. So I, I'll probably, now that you mention it, I'm probably going to add this to my next, next video. I'm probably going to go deeper on this next week. But this is for false law. So it says the, the female, not the male, determines all the conditions of the animal family where the female can derive no benefit from association with the male. No such association takes place. This is because there's inherent... Uh, the, re the, the foundation of this law, um, and you know, remember, he's doing this not from a position of biology, he's doing it from a position of the institution of marriage. So, whereas typically you would find laws in nature, this is a law that specifically relates specifically to human, human ethology. The reason this exists is because the social bond the social contract is ultimately a security blanket, security against starvation, security against outside threats, and security for the future. That there's a future planning element. A woman cares about a man's future like a man cares about a woman's past, specifically because of the idea that if a man cannot satisfy the conditions of security that a woman needs, there are multiple other men that can fulfill that role instead. This is the thing about Giselle Bündchen. She is an, she is clearly, you know, wall full steam ahead being in her forties. And she assumes that she can live to the same lifestyle expectations without her husband. What people forget about Brafalt's law, and I'm, I'm just going to keep this up on the screen for now. What people, what people forget about Brafalt's law is that it is not an inherently logical decision. Uh, so, for example, where the female can derive no benefit from association with the male, no such association takes place. The thing is, is that you know manipulators, you know people who can twist this around. The benefit only has to be, and this is why so many women are susceptible to propaganda and so many people in general are susceptible to propaganda. There only has to be the illusion of benefit. There has to be the illusion of or the assumption of benefit. That doesn't always have to play out in real life. This is how you can know women is like, why is she still with this guy if he's a scumbag or abusive or doesn't treat her or whatever? 
you get you get that nice guy complex. Pe men think that you can just be like a nice guy, and this and there will be like, oh well, that's the benefit. The benefit from association has to include some sort of counterbalance brought up by the male. The male has to hold the woman accountable and have the same. I think Kevin Samuel said an abundance mindset. All that means is having options. Don't get hung up on what a single woman or female has to think about your compatibility with her lifestyle. That's the entire thing. Because at the end of the day, this association is inherently one-sided. This is the key. So if we look at, and, and, this, and this is difficult, she doesn't have to buy it. Because the man's fulfillment, okay, if it's purely sexual, if it's companionship, if it's kids, whatever. The difference is, is that there is a distinct and clear benefit given to women for a reason. Because in human society, we have a, a necessity placed upon men to prove their worth in the dating market. And this is why I say, don't let anyone decide your worth for you. Don't let anyone decide and check off boxes for what makes you worthy in this society. Don't let people tell you that any physical, like, oh, you need to be so tall and have so much money and have and be so well endowed and have so many accolades, so many this and so many that. It's like, dude, I don't care if you're like a bald, white, chubby manlet who can't even like see his own equipment. Like, don't let anybody, don't let anybody determine your worth for you. It's it's something where, you know, this is the 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 comeuppance at the end of the day. The people who view love as transactional, as ephemeral, the butterflies are gone. So, you know, don't have any duty. A woman doesn't need to buy a loving husband because there's plenty of ways to make almost any normal man into a loving husband. Well, a woman, and because a man can buy sex, sure. Man can buy sex, but he also can't buy companionship either. You know, a man can't buy a loving wife. Just as a woman can't buy a loving husband. What's the difference? Is that I don't, I don't need a loving wife. I don't. A man can live his own life perfectly content, perfectly happy. Because as society deems it, it's like, you're the one who's trying to live off my paycheck. I'm not trying to live off your paycheck. The man doesn't assume or require any of the necessary securities that Brefault's law dictates would be would be the main impetus for us. Where our, our impetus is not the woman's finances. I mean, unless you're a master manipulator and you're trying to find a sugar mama. The main impetus of a man, the main impetus is either driven by sex or companionship. But what a woman wants, a loving husband, what a woman really wants is all the security that loving husband will provide. That loving husband will put up with all of her crap and keep providing for her forever. And this is how it works. It's like, it's, it, it is the relationship itself is a two-way street. The man is a gatekeeper to marriage because you can have a platonic or you can be right up in the friend zone. You can be totally fin domed by this girl, like spending tons of money on her only fans, trying to get exclusive premium access to her Snapchat. She can keep you teased forever. But the funniest thing is, is you talk to those Sims, they would never marry those girls. It's like these guys, it's the funniest thing, funniest thing. It's like, I, I talked to these guys. It's like, these guys will spend $20,000 on an e-thought, but would never marry them. Think about that. Think, it's insane. It's, it's, it's the craziest thing. It's like the, the marriage has become, for most men, regardless of age, the only exception are like the Gen X guys who can't learn their lesson. They're like divorced and married like five times. But it's like now there's zero. And, men, and women know this too. This It's crazy. It's like, Feminism is kind of coming full circle so they realize what men demanded of this relationship. Like the reason we are the gatekeepers is because you have to be wife material to get married. You know, there's no, this is the only ring I'm going to possess unless you have wife traits. You don't need wife traits 
to be sexually appealing. You don't even need wife traits to be a decent girlfriend. You have to have an element of duty and sacrifice and commitment that goes above and beyond what you would expect for someone you're just casually dating. And because promiscuity is so ubiquitous in society, women think that it's just enough to provide their body. But when you do that, and what these women nowadays forget when looking at what people, women in the past did, they withheld that. You're not getting sex until we're married. And if all the women do that, then that is one of the biggest incentives for men to, to do it. Even, even if they see all these other things that are wrong with marriage, their own libido will betray them, their, their own desire. And even then men will walk away because they're like, juice ain't worth the squeeze. Even then, even then when women try everything in their power, it, the men still have to make the conscious decision because that's what's at stake. That's what's being asked for when it comes to women in their late twenties and early thirties looking for a man. They, they make decent money. You know, we live in a fairly equal and feminist society. They make decent money usually in a, in a myriad of careers middle, middle management, whatever, actually making a decent five figure income, at least the average for the American 50, 60, $70,000 a year. Want a man who makes more than them back in the day, you just have to provide like back in the day. It's like you could, you could make $50,000 a year or 40,000 or 30, even $30,000 a year. You can make was basically minimum wage, still get married, be happy. Because she also makes thirty thousand dollars, your wages combined it makes sixty thousand. What's wrong with that? But that's not what they want. It's like there's this weird princess complex, this weird forty nine er, like thing. It's it's um, it's like Western women are spoiled. This is this is why I tell people get a passport, man. Like, I mean, Edwin, even though he got married to a Colombian girl, that that Colombian girl's ride or die, bro. The Colombian girl's not as not nearly as entitled as like I've I've met Mexican girls. And Hispanic girls, like Latinas in general, like Filipinas, especially in, in the Bay Area, spoiled, spoiled like you wouldn't believe. I'm like, I even told this one girl straight up. She's like super small. I'm like I could find, I could go to the Philippines right now, find a girl 10 times more attractive than you who will give me a fraction of the BS you're giving me right now. And it set her, it set her off completely. But it's, but it was true. It's like, I could go to the Philippines right now, go to any random village, find a girl that's way cute find 10 girls that are cuter than you and every single one of them would, would say yes if i asked them out on a date with no questions and i know i could with, with no questions and yet you're going to sit here and act like you have something it's, this is why men go and get passports it's the essential reason why the so david the one thing and i'll say i'll say this is easy as well the one thing that you have to ask yourself is what do you want out of marriage? Seriously. Like, what is it? The main thing you want? Is it the kids? Is it the companionship? Is it the expectations or the acknowledgement of your family? Is it living right in the eyes of God or something? Like, what is it? Like, what is your main, what would be your main reason to get married? Beyond what anybody else could convince you of, you have to ask yourself, what do you want from your own life? Like, what is it that you really want for yourself? Is this what you want for yourself? And is, and is the deal worth it? Like that's, that's what's driven. This is why the marriage rates are at bottom low. Men come to terms with the fact it's like, okay, do I really want, do I really want all of this extra hassle to achieve something I'm not even sure that I really want. Because if it's kids, it's like, you don't need to be married to have children. I mean, what's, what's, I mean, the main thing it's like, an, or if you want to have kids, it's like, okay, do they, do you really need to have to be married to do that? And furthermore, do you even need, do you need to be married to an American woman to, to achieve that? And, and this is also a good point. This is where I speak out against the nice guys. Cause I think we've all been here like the nice guy. Like if you think you're just nice enough that you'll be able to get a girl, this is where, okay. 
so to want um to want a limited weapon okay so the companionship you receive so i heard from a guy who's married because i have married friends it's like your wife should be your best friend wife should be your best friend should be your confidant should be you know everything else comes along with it but at the end of the day you know ride or die they should be there for you there should be a codependency in marriage fundamentally people act like codependency is unhealthy you do not want a strong independent woman as your wife because without any without any extra incentive to keep her there what's to stop her from scheming on you what's to stop her from leaving it's like i'm fine on my own two feet that's not what you want even in a man you, you don't want that in a man either the issue is is that guys come out with this straight on the sleeve the codependency has to come about because you genuinely can't see your life without this person. Not because you're a massive groveling simp of a nice guy and just think that, oh yeah, like I, it's like, like, I, I don't know. I think like the fact that guys are like, oh, well, girls only want the, the bad, the bad boys or whatever. It's not true. They want, they want guys who are unattached. It's like, they want guys who are distant. It's like what, what these girls want are not marriage quality men. It's like if a guy wants a marriage quality woman, if a, if a woman wants a marriage quality man, it's a different ball game. Because at one time, it's like if you want someone who's promiscuous, that doesn't really have a gender role to it. There's no gender role to promiscuity. It's like the person finds you attractive. Bada bing, bada boom. That's all there is to it. Finds you attractive. Your personality is manageable. But the actual marriage component, what a man and a woman bring to the marriage, that's different. You're, you're dealing with a completely different ball game. And for these guys, like, look at them. They lead with their wallets. They lead with their status. They, they pull a Tom Brady. But also, they just assume, they, they have this weird assumption, you have to be, still be, even in the marriage, even with this codependency, still be your own man. This shows a fundamental lack of male confidence and self-assuredness when you feel like you have to use your wife as an emotional crutch. Men should not require love to exist. It's, it sounds it sounds horrifically bleak, sure. But there's you shouldn't be running on love. You don't run on love. You you should be running on ambition. You should be running on personal interests. It's it's love of self that should be governing your life not the love of somebody else. And that's why like, oh, if you, and then you hear all this crap all the time. It's like, oh, if you, if you can't be sure with yourself, then you shouldn't even try to do It's like first and foremost, caring too much in the first place is the biggest issue. The biggest thing is, is like, if you can't convince me logically, give me a logical reason why I should put half my finances and my entire future on the chopping block, then it's just not going to happen. It's like, you could be my best friend in the world, but I'm not going to go file a contract with the government. Like I'll get married in a church, but I'm not going to go file a marriage certificate so you can, you know, Giselle me in 13 years. Cause I mean, think about it. Guy got married and he's 33 or 32 years old. Could he, could he have seen that at 45, his wife's going to divorce him? No, no way. And for no other reason, it's like people act like, Oh, well there was a reason, right? Like, no. It's like, she just had enough. Just decided I'm, you know, midlife crisis new new year new me and decided to eat pray love this dude but that's the thing dude it's like that is the biggest decision you're ever gonna make the one you can stand it's like and some people they just get lucky and find their unicorn the guy but as guys it's like you can't be upset if you don't and honestly and if you this is why like it, nobody's perfect you're never gonna find a perfect woman you are not the perfect man there's no the one there is no magical angel that's going to fall from the sky or into your lap. They're imperfect. You have to deal with the, with what the dating pool gives you. Some guys find their unicorns. You cannot survivors bias yourself. Some guys, they, they have a lot of success in some areas and not a lot of success in others. Like some guys, they will never go anywhere in their career, but they found like a great wife, someone who they're, who is really like their soulmate. But they may not be able to have kids or there might be some horrible accident or they have a great life and they're just 
super like Chad to your blessed. And you just have to be like, you have to be accepting of that. You have to be accepting of the fact that, you know, some people have doomed cursed lives. Some people have these great lives. You just can't compare yourself to them and you can't let yourself uh, take other people's negative experiences and make them your own. You just have to be smart about how you approach life. One of the biggest things you can do to mess up your life is, and this is like three things I've heard. It's like, if you stay full-time gainfully employed for at least 15 or 20 years, if you avoid as much debt as possible, if you stay debt-free, and if you don't have children out of wedlock or get divorced, then you will be middle-class, regardless of if you're flipping burgers at a McDonald's or sweeping the street. You will you will breach out of the working class and into the middle class in America if you invest even remotely in anything, and you don't fall for these common pitfalls. But for men, in the past, marriage was a source of social status. It was a source of um, stability in old age, like a young man's folly and an old man's comfort. It's it was it's a source of status. It's a source of respect to be married in many cultures, even in the modern day in business. It's like, I can take this guy seriously. Like he has mouths to feed, but because of the institutions at, at play now, there is zero. And even any, just because times are changing, you see like, Oh, the boss been divorced three times. There is zero, zero impetus, zero actual legitimate reason for a man to go and get married in them in 2023. Give it, give it, it's like, tell a man like, oh man, I, you might not get that promotion because you're not married. It's like, okay, I, I lose that on a promotion and don't lose half my stuff though. And it's because their bosses, their bosses who they look up to maybe, or just see this guy's balling, guys balling, been divorced three times. This one thing that I realized the game, it's like the game has changed. Because men have woken up. Nothing else has changed. The, remember, these Gen X boomer guys will get married, remarried three, four, five times. They will not learn their lesson. They will be on marriage number six and still not learn their damn lesson. They will not have learned anything from their past five marriages. They just want to be married. Absolute clownery. It's like young, young guys just aren't falling for it. And I get it. Guys in their 20s aren't going to want to, like, you know, they talk about, like, oh, guys only want to sell down in their 30s. And I see that. I see that. Like, I, I see the urge. But it's like, I'm going to get a password, dude. I'm, I'm going to go to Central or Eastern Europe or I'm going to go to Latin America. I'm not, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to. I don't even know if I want to even stay in America. But if I'm going to get a woman and if I'm going to bring her back here, first and foremost, I'm going to I'm going to live in a rural area big big one i'm not I'm, it's like even suburbs now are just crap in america because they're like you know oh she's gonna turn into a feminist I'm like i'm not gonna have a tv in my home yeah i mean yeah she's oh she wants to be a feminist and do what it's like she doesn't she has nowhere to go no contacts no it's like there there is an element of strength that you have when you are the only rock in in somebody's life and you could say it's like oh it's manipulative some people do actually you know, take advantage of people because of that. But that's what you want. Like the, the biggest reason these, these women walk away from their husband, like look at Giselle, she walks away because she's established in Hollywood now. I mean, nobody cares. It's not like she's like Amber Heard, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's an outdated institution. It's not even that it's outdated. This is a traditional, this is a serious religious customary cultural institution that has been completely and utterly gutted and worn like a sock puppet by the courts and by the government. The moment you, and, and like, it might be controversial even like say this, but once you started playing around with who could and couldn't get married and you started playing around with like putting the state, like make all these regulations on marriage and made, and especially setting up the divorce of family courts the way they have, I don't know what they honestly expected. I don't know what they expected. It was already, it's already, you know, a difficult thing to convince a man to settle down. And then you're going to say like, oh, well, yeah, here's a business contract where 
at any time your partner can pull out and take half your stuff, whether they earned it or not. So let me see. Yeah. Don't bring her to America. Yeah. The only reason I say this is because I know from example that keeping them in their own country too is a bit of a risk. So for example, let, let's take like, I don't know, let's, let's take uh, like Brazil. You go to Brazil, find a girl, go to the village. It's like, where are you actually going to stay? Like, say you're going to move there and live with your like cutie Romanian, like Romanian GF or your, your cutie Ukrainian GF or something. And it's like you go and it's like you live in what Kiev, like post-war Kharkiv or something. And yeah, and it's true. It's just internet will do, but it's like, you could already just, the so the girl who already is there, the reason I say this is like guys make the mistake every single time of bringing their girls to America and then they go to university. Absolutely. Like, it's not even that like bringing them to America is the problem. It's just that they introduce them to friends or have them make friends that like lead them down the path that are, it's like the sisterhood. It's like they, they let them get involved with the sisterhood and it just all goes down. And it's like, and men need, and men, especially husbands need to be aware of who their wives hang out with. They always look out for the guys, but it's like, bro, like the male coworker friend is probably the last person you need to worry about. It's her, it's her stupid self-destructive female friends that resent the fact that she's happily married. That's going to try to shoot her marriage down. So they're like, Oh, you're in America now. You know, you can, you can, it's like you, you, why settle for this guy? You can get with a girl who looks as good as you. Like you can get, you know, divorce this clown and get with that guy. World's your oyster. They, they don't tell you that no guy's going to marry a divorcee. They're not going to tell you that this guy's going <laughs> to, you know, see that as a walking red flag. It's like, dude, try to, try to convince this, you know, a guy who's all six. It's like, oh yeah, you can get this guy, but not as a divorced 30 something. You're not. And so that's, that's the, that's the snake poison that they do with these married women. It's like this girl, um, this girl probably thinks like Tom Brady's wife probably thinks like, oh yeah, I'm going to divorce Tom Brady. And then everybody's going to be on me. It's like, no, you're just, now you're just a divorced single mother in her forties. It doesn't matter if you're like a starlet or whatever, or a model. It's like, bro, it's like, you just, you just want the forbidden fruit. But it got to be careful because those same temptations exist everywhere now. It's like the internet, the internet allows them to be like that everywhere. It's just that reality kind of reality hits them hard. Like when I was in Croatia, I saw that firsthand. It's like, dude, money goes a lot farther in, in those countries than it does here. And it's just a lower bar to achieve. Like they, it's like still they, they won't look at the, the, you know, Piotr doing, doing you know, picking up trash in the street. They're not going to, they don't care about, you know, Mr. Barista Bjorn doing his thing. You come in foreigner with foreign money and it's, it checks all the same boxes that Western women do. It's just, they have lower standards. So you, you still have to watch out for who you marry. You still have to watch out for predators. It's like that girl might still end up divorcing you if you stay in her home country. It's just that if you take her to America, she's going to be more directly dependent on you but she might you know, she might do the same thing to you just in her home country it's like what is what's the difference especially if her country has similar laws which people don't think about it's like look at that guy and what, what was it was it peru where he where he like changed his gender to female to get custody of his kids because the courts always sided with the woman it's like in these poor countries man oftentimes the marriage laws can be even more biased against men Especially when it comes to kids, like your know, custody laws in some of these nations are like, oh yeah, bro, get a passport, move to such and such a place. And then if you actually look at the courts, they're like giving the kid, like doesn't matter if the mom's, you know, beating these kids in the courthouse, smoking crack on the steps, like they'll still give the kid to the mom over the dad. It's just how it is. Yeah. And, and honestly, it's the society too. So like you have to understand how, how the society you're in also affects the way that you're going to go about this marriage. So it's like, are you going to be poisoned by staying in the culture that she's from? It's like, cause you also have the option of moving. Like you could also just go to another country that isn't any of where you all came from and you could have the best of both worlds. So there's ways to do this, but yeah, I agree. I wouldn't, for example, I would never bring a bride back to California. I would never go to like Croatia, marry a girl and bring her back to California. It's just, 
not going to happen. Like if we do move to back to America, it's going to be rural somewhere else. I'm not going to bring her anywhere near civilization. That's for sure. It's because, yeah, it's like the big, biggest mistake you can make is marry a girl from the city in another country and then bring her back to a big city in America. Or especially the biggest mistakes I see is bringing her back and putting her through school so that she can be exposed to all these people who tell her to like eat, pray, love and leave her husband and stuff. Especially if you're young, like if you're under 25 and married. Oh, my God, dude. It's like you you have to deal with so many snakes I want to tell you to like break up with your husband and stuff. It's, yeah, I've I've heard and seen things that you wouldn't believe, man. Like I like I'm I'm 27, and I even in my life as an adult, going places, doing things, seeing what I've seen, it's it's hard. It'll it's hard to convince me to to, to you 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 would have to gaslight like CIA torture me into like not not coming to the conclusions I've come to based purely off everything I've seen from the time I was a kid growing up through the, through the first recession, the housing crisis, seeing all my friends, parents get divorced and stuff. It's just, yeah. And especially like being near an air force base, like just seeing all the Jodies and all the cheating and all the, all the BS and the portrayal that goes on between like military wives and their husbands. Yeah. Even if you'll ever see this government is still going to tax you. NAFTA is unenforced. NAFTA was, or not NAFTA, but the um, uh, NASC, or no, uh, FATCA. No, is it is it FATCA? I think it is FATCA. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's FATCA, not FAFSA. It's all these letters. But FATCA has not been enforced since it was implemented. They tried to try to, they tried to actually enforce FATCA um, during the. Like Obama implemented it. They tried to enforce it now under Biden. You obviously can see how well it's gone. So FATCA is actually not enforced. You're supposed to file a tax credit if you make over $100,000 because you're assumed to be getting taxed by your host nation. The thing is, is that maybe with this IRS bloat, they're going to try to enforce FATCA, but it, it's not been enforced. But foreign banks don't want to work together with the IRS. They don't being like, they don't being... Now, they don't like being forced into doing the, the bidding of the United States, even if they are U.S. allies. Most of the banks will either not bank with Americans or they just straight up will not work together with the IRS. So this whole FATCA thing is just a mess. They say it's like if you're if you're such a the blue pilled, you know, you know, Zog bot that you still file your taxes when you live in a foreign country. I just don't know what to tell you that that is that is the most cucked blue pilled behavior I've ever heard. To anyone who pays their taxes living on foreign soil, and unless it's to that country, it's just you're 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 tripping. You are tripping because even if you're audited, they'll have to prove that you have all these assets and stuff. Like the paper trail doesn't even exist. The IRS has to hope and pray that whatever bank you're using will cooperate with you. And if you put all your money in silver, or your boss tells the IRS to shove rocks, that's it. So and yeah, good it, again. This is why I like, don't be Andrew Tate. Don't brag about <laughs> how you get away not paying taxes by using Bitcoin and all your strategies. Like I can, I can say this because, you know, I mean, honestly, who's going to watch this? I'm not Andrew Tate, but like, don't, you, you, you gotta be smart, but don't, don't, don't brag. Like there's a lot of ways to not play the game and to, and to get the best of the system that you're in, but yeah, bro, you gotta be gotta be sensible too. Don't don't get all cocky with it. Like I, I like the Panama Papers. Like honestly, if they're not gonna go after the guys in the Panama Papers, like Zelensky and Jackie Chan were in the Panama Papers. Like if they're not gonna go after those guys, like come on, bro, they're not gonna trip about you not paying U.S. taxes in in wherever you live. It's ridiculous. No one cares. The IRS is dealing with the other 325 million Americans, but. So, so here's, here's another aspect to it. This is why you don't get married for sex point blank. Cause eventually you're both going to be decrepit and disgusting. You're both going to be painful to look at naked. If you get together purely for sexual satisfaction, I mean, I, I don't, even, I don't even know how people get to the marriage phase. I think people at that point get married just for the, just for the, I guess, appearances of things, but 
I, I honestly, I don't see the point of marrying. Like the entire concept of marrying for love is just an oxymoron to me. Because every time I hear married for love, it's literally just I'm attracted to this person and we're just like making it work. It's like at the end of the day, you're not you're not this with this person because you love them. Because if it was love, it's like you would have gotten with a thousand of the other, you know, nice guy simps that doted on you all the time. It's like that guy, you know, all th those guys would have loved you unconditionally for sure. But you don't want those guys. Those guys weren't attracted to you. They and again, it's like, why would you be? It's like they're clingy and they're not self-assured as men. They, they are desperate and they act like they need you. So who cares? But at the same time, like, yeah, it's, it's, and you know, it's like, what is it? Latina's law, like the older a Latina gets, like the chances of her becoming fat approach one. It's like, that's, that's probably my favorite, one of my favorite laws. But yeah, Chives. Yeah. Yeah, it's so the way I approach things as well with this too, and I'm hitting I'm hitting the four hour mark, so I might wrap it up, but I'm gonna cover a lot of this in my next ethology video because it's gonna talk about civilizational uh ethology. So I talked about like Stone Age stuff, it's gonna start covering civilization. But this this is a very poignant thing. It's again, one of my favorite quotes of all time, literally comes from a video game, but still you got to be patient when others are greedy and greedy when others are patient. So it's like, if you find this person, if you see the opportunity and you're like, you know, don't be afraid to, to get into a relationship, to court, to date the entire point of dating and the entire point. And it's like, guys are like, I'm going to give up on dating because there's just no point. It's okay to give up on marriage. It's okay to give up on, on long-term commitment, but to date is just to try to date is to like, it's like, you know, winners never quit and quitters never win, but just don't be, don't like sell half your finances to this person. You know, like it's okay to date. It's okay to like get to know somebody. It's okay to like, you know, s suss them out. Cause there are those unicorns. Remember there's exceptions to every rule. I mean, there's a, it's a Noxal fantasy. Like not all X are like this. And they point to like the radical third standard deviation, but those five percenters exist, man. Those five percenters, you know, people are like, oh, you can't find, I was like, you know, I've met virgins who are 25 years old. You know, I've, I've met girls who are actually decent marriage material. It's just that they are unicorns. They are rare to find. You have to be lucky. You have to have statistics on your side. The best thing you can do is not care. The closer you are to the ground, the closer you are to reality. Because it's like, what does it mean to be close to the ground? It means to be settled. You're touching grass. You know, you're, you're not living in some idealistic fairy la-la land where you think Mr. or Mrs. Wright's just come out of nowhere. And I think a lot of men, a lot of men have come to terms with this. I don't think a lot of women have. I, I think a lot of women still are waiting on their Prince Charming, that it's all just going to come together, that they can party and have their fun and ride their carousels. And that, you know, they'll be in their early thirties and this man's just going to sweep them off their feet. That's just not how it works. It's just not how it works. And I, I think like men, I think most men, especially men that are invisible to women, and they just, that's just how it is. Like, I remember being a kid and being invisible to women. And it's so strange now. It's like who I am at 27 versus who I was at 17 versus who I was at seven. It's like completely different. I've, I've been, I've been invisible to women until I was about, you know, until I really took my health seriously and started gaining weight. I wasn't visible to women. I didn't even start having success in, in dealing with women and befriending women or dating women at all until I was 21 years old. So it's like, I spent all of my teen years being like, like a literal 90 pound man, like completely invisible to women, not knowing how to talk. It's like, I remember being th that kid. And it's just funny to me now, thinking back and looking back, the main thing that changed with me is that I focused on myself first and foremost. I placed myself first. I didn't live my life to please anyone but myself. I didn't, I wasn't doing what I was doing to please women. I wasn't doing what I was doing to please my family, I wasn't doing what I was doing to, I mean, honestly, it was like the only person I'm beholden to is God and to myself. I have to be personally accountable. And the times in my life that I'm the most happy is when I'm living up to my own standards and doing things for myself. And I feel like the, the problem with modern society is that you're just expected to bend over backwards and sacrifice and care and like give up 
this love of self and give up this this self-respect and this self-assurance so that some 30 something late 20s parasite with like five eggs left can like latch onto you and make your life a living hell and take you for half your stuff and make you never see your kids because because what because society wants you it's like that you accept this deal or you're an incel or you're a, a mig tau or whatever or it's like it's a buzzword like a buzzword's all you're coming back to me in a response to a completely broken court system completely broken dating pool a society full of promiscuous dyed haired tattooed overweight feminists and you're going to sit here and tell me that that the way to get that the way to get men to get married again is to shame them it's just that's just not going to work but anyway guys i'm hitting the four hour mark it's been really great um i think i i, I posted the discord earlier i'm going to post it back in chat but um, yeah, so here's the, uh, I'm going to type out the Discord link and pin it in case uh, anybody, anybody wants it. But it's, uh, GG, I cannot type. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been fun. But yeah, I, I will leave you with this. Again, there's, there are so many ways to live one's life. There's so many opportunities to take. But one of the worst things that you can do, man, is one of the worst things you can do is just take people at face value to blindly trust, to blindly follow, to blindly live up, not to yourself and what you want for yourself, but to live up to society. Because that's how guys end up like Tom Brady. That's how guys end up uh, unhappy, genuinely unhappy. Not You can be absolutely rich. You can be very attractive. You can, you can be well-to-do, very charismatic, have all the boxes ticked and still be a miserable, curmudgeonly person on the inside because you're not living life for you. Your, your, you know, your happiness is determined by the internal quality of your thoughts, the feelings that you have about yourself, the feelings about, you, how about your place in the world. And people derive satisfaction from self-actualization, from that fulfillment. But ultimately... What it really takes is not letting other people decide your happiness for you. If you feel like, oh, I'm miserable because I can't get a girlfriend, or I'm, I'm miserable because I I can't, you know, get a get a super good paying job, or I don't have my my, you know, I'm, I'm not super duper handsome, and I I have this and I have that. Like everybody struggles. There's there's no one on this planet that's perfect. Even Andrew Tate's bald, you know. Like this, it, we gotta we gotta understand our flaws. And even then, even then, if you are the perfect guy. Eventually, you're 20 years from now, you're going to be an old, salty piece of crap. So it doesn't even matter. It's like you could be perfect. You could be checking all the boxes at 30, but then you could lose everything by 50. So it's like your your self contentment, your self respect, and that it, it should be the most paramount thing that you should foster in your life. Because what I notice is that regardless whether they're manosphere, whether they're you know feminists or misogynists, whatever, the main thing I notice with these people is that they're bitter and unhappy. There's bitter and unhappy people in the manosphere that lash out. There's bitter and unhappy people in the feminist sphere that lash out. And just don't be that person. Don't care. The worst thing you can do is place the weight of other people's words and opinions about yourself rather than your own thoughts and opinions about yourself. And with what I'm trying to do here is if I can educate and get that through to anybody, then it's worth it. But um, it's been a great stream. Here is my Discord link. Um, I think I spelled that right. Yeah, I think I spelled that right. All right. It's been great. It's been four hours. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks DZ for showing up. Um, just so anybody knows if you do chat, I will show it. I know some people they're they're shameless grifting pieces of crap and they won't do that. I will, even if you want to talk smack, I will uh, pull you up and then roast you. So yeah, have a great night guys. It's been a really fun one. Um, I did not expect to be here for four hours, but the fact that I was is great. And yeah, take care, David. Take care, DZ. And uh, and yeah, guys, I will see you next week. I will make another community post and I'll also post in the Discord. So whether or not you're there, um, I'll try to stay visible for next time. But have a great weekend.